This is Jocko Podcast number 256 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. <laughs> and joining us once again is Dave Burke. Good evening, Dave. Good evening. And tonight we are going to wrap the final installment on guidelines for the leader and commander by General Bruce Clark. This is the subject of podcasts, plural. 251, 252, 253, 254, 255, and now finally 256. So much to learn. Taking the lessons that were passed on to Colonel David Hackworth, who served in Korea and Vietnam, wrote the book about face, taught me many leadership lessons. Well, he learned those lessons from this book written by General Bruce Clark, who served in Korea, World War II, World War I, who led many soldiers, trained even more, including one that he didn't even know about, me. And we are trying to pass those lessons on. So for the final installment, let's get back to the book. Guidelines for the Leader and Commander. Chapter 11, physical conditioning. There you go, Echo Charles. I'm sure your interest just got peaked. (laughs) Here we go. I would like to pass on to you for such implementation as may be practicable within your several commands and within your various types of headquarters and units some thoughts on the problem of physical exercise, physical condition, and physical training. This is a complex subject. Its success depends on the program each commander works out to fit his needs and facilities, and then enthusiastically and energetically pushes. While many of our units and individuals are in fine physical shape, this is not universally true in many commands. I believe it can be made more nearly universally true by a more general concept as to its importance and to a consideration of the implementation of practical steps that can be taken in this field without materially interfering with our other activities. What grade are you giving General Clark for simplicity on that whole opening? <laughs> I'm not giving him a good grade. Luckily, he redeemed, you're going to see he redeems himself in the end of this book with some real simple, clear, concise. So he thinks that, you know, the simple statement is people should be working out. <laughs> I believe strongly that good physical condition is one of the evidences of a spree in a unit as well as of morale in an individual. So it helps both your team and you as a person. Now, here's where we have a serious beef. Serious beef. Probably one of the most serious beefs ever for me with General Clark. This topic is called calisthenics at end of day. Hmm. Echo, you're probably going to want to throw down with this one. You're going to throw in with him. (laughs) On one occasion, I visited a unit and observed calisthenics being conducted during the first period of the morning. This was being done in the normal way by a junior sergeant conducting the exercises with the senior non-commissioned officers and officers standing around to supervise and monitor. Possibly the ones who needed the exercise the most were the ones observing. That's a good one, right? You don't want to be that guy. You don't want to be that guy that's standing there with a small arms telling people they need to do more pull-ups, right? No. You don't want to find yourself in that situation, no, do you, sir. Echo? No, sir, I do not. <laughs> but then he says this, I do not think calisthenics or other physical training exercise in the first hour of the day is good. Of course, as we know, I definitely think that working out in the first hour of the day is good. If they are done strenuously enough, to be of any value so that the men work up perspiration, the men then wear the same wet clothes throughout the day or until such clothing dries on them. Similarly, if men perform exercises requiring them to sit on the ground or lie on the ground, they start off the day with dirty and maybe wet clothing. Now for me, General Clark, all due respect, I think we can just take a shower and change clothes yes, when we're done working out. Yeah. I think we can overcome that in the modern era. Yeah, I gotta admit that kind of surprised me as being the first reason that he's talking about yeah, why like, not to work out first thing in the morning. Yeah, because we, we, we could just shower. Seems easy <laughs> to solve that problem, yeah. I will say this, though. I think he's coming from a time period where they didn't have this full, like this was only an idea that was just coming to fruition, right? So it wasn't a thing yet. Yeah. It wasn't a thing to work out. Mm-hmm. So people didn't have workout clothes. Uh, people didn't have workout shoes. People didn't have workout bag. 
you know, these people didn't have a workout bag. They didn't have your the little freaking Reebok bag or whatever that Echo Charles <laughs> takes to twenty four hour fitness. <laughs> Get your curls on. Yeah. So they didn't have that back then. So he's thinking, yeah, you show up to work, and the first thing we're gonna do is build up a sweat. Now we're gonna be wet the clothes all day. All right, we, we'll give you, we'll cut you some slack. And then he says, I believe it is far more reasonable to devote the last hour in the afternoon to physical exercising and physical training so that the men can go from it to the showers and get into other clothing for supper and the evening. This is the time when the mind is tired and training requiring mental attention is least effective. Okay, so that's, okay, so, all right, so we, we're just gonna jump past like all the whole thing about the, when you're working out. Because I think it's just, I think we're beyond that now in the modern era. Yeah. I don't think we're, I think we can work out whenever it makes the most sense, not based on our sweat and clothing. I think. Can we yeah. put that, can we set that one aside? I agree, yes, we can. So now this is interesting. This is the time when the mind is tired and training requiring mental attention is least effective. Doesn't it take a certain level of mental effort to do a hard workout? Yeah. Don't don't you think? Yes, it Dave. Does. Yes. I wonder if he's thinking like intellectual effort. Right. I get that, and I get that too. Like for instance, this might sound stupid. Uh, when I'm going to when I'm going to, let's say it's it's late at night, and I'm like tired. And I've got some more reading to do. I'll read until I'm just going to fall asleep. And then I'll get up, brush my teeth, whatever, take my supplements, as Echo likes to say. So I'll do my little evening routine, floss. Every day. And then, and then I'll have like, you know, I stood up, so now I'm, I can read a little bit longer. I can go a little bit longer. And then I go to sleep. So when you do something, I guess that, that what I'm saying is you get bored. So maybe this is a good plan. Hey, it's the end of the day. You're kind of tired. You don't feel like focusing on this. What'd you call it, Dave? Intellectual work. Effort. Yeah. Yeah. You don't. You don't. You you've spent your intellectual energy, but you can still just go jack some steel, possibly. Okay. I don't. I don't agree. Think that that's the case for some of us. That like no man. When you're mentally exhausted i mean sure there are some circumstances but mm -hmm. as a general sort of way and approach to working out i don't know man i, can, I don't know if i can get there quite yet okay but we'll see what he so you want to have you want to be mentally fresh for yeah. your workout yes okay all right back to the book in two divisions and in a brigade in which i served everyone stopped activities at four o'clock on two days a week with the exception of the necessary duty officers guards and everyone at the from the commanding general Everyone from the commanding general on down took physical exercises. This physical exercising consisted of activities that provided a real workout. None of this Echo Charles stuff. <laughs> real workout. <laughs> Certain well-organized selected games were allowed, provided that everyone played. Organized calisthenics were allowed, but the bulk of the units engaged in a four-mile trot and fast walk to, co to be completed in 50 minutes. Yeah, so bro, we're talking 12 minute miles or whatever. We're not, this is not, this is not a challenge. And here's what, here, as I thought through this, it started to make a little bit more sense. Combat boots with proper socks were worn by all personnel in order to get the men used to and prevent damage to their feet, right? Above the top of the boots, everyone was permitted to prescribe their own uniform within the realm of decency. This gave men a feeling of freedom which added to the relaxation and benefit of exercise. Okay, so that's cool. I do not think this lack of uniformity hurt the discipline of the unit. It was not a show. Men, tra men traveled the previously laid out four mile courses as individuals being checked at the start and finish to record their times in order to motivate the slow ones by falling. So this is just, we you know, he just kind of prescribes this weird like four mile walk that everyone's gonna go on, which tells me earlier when I said they weren't, that working out wasn't really like a thing yet. Yeah. It wasn't. Yeah. Because if they're thinking, 50 minutes and four miles. But the only thing I can say about that also is if you're talking about a whole division or a whole brigade of people, like these are not all frontline soldiers, obviously. These are administrative people and whatever, the general himself. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, 
And by following the course as individuals instead of a formation, no one exercised so strenuously as to do himself damage regardless of his physical condition or age. Care should be taken in starting such a program to work into it reasonably so as not to increase the sick call rate. I, I, you, I think if you, look, if you imagine like a corporation, like a giant corporation, a division-sized corporation with whatever, 10 or 15,000 people in it, and they were gonna start a physical training program, this might be an okay program. You got mm-hmm. 50 minutes, you gotta go out, you gotta move four miles, go for a walk, whatever. I think that's, I think that's almost the perspective that he's coming from. Okay. <clears throat> I don't know though. Cause didn't he just say a real workout? Yeah, and, like that kind and of there stuff? should be sweating. I mean, I'm not sweating after a after 12 minute miles for four miles, and I sweat a lot, as you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <sighs> well, let's just be thankful that we are where we are, where where we've learned so much about physical training, yeah. and which has changed a lot. I mean, yeah. did you see that picture I posted the other day of? I was like yelling at one of my friends back in the day, and he's doing yeah. cable crossovers. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't just tell what he was doing. Crazy, but he yeah. was doing just cable crossovers. Yeah, hell yeah, building hardcore the chest. building Sculpting the, the chest, building the what the lower pecs. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to you to try to yell at him while he's doing that exercise too. It's not like he was doing deadlifts. Or I something think we like were this. just messing around actually. Uh, Physical exercise program. The Secretary of the Army has written to commanders about the tendency to to move troops from barracks to work and from barracks to training areas by vehicle instead of marching them when it is practicable to march. He pointed out that it's very important that the troops retain the ability to march and especially was, and this was especially important in mechanized and motorized armor units. So that's a great point. When you have the opportunity to march, Instead of riding a vehicle, you should march instead of riding a vehicle. That's one thing that's cool about buds. In buds, you run to f- din- you run to breakfast and back. You run to lunch and back. You run to dinner and back. It's a mile there. It's a mile back. So you're doing six miles a day mm-hmm. before anything. Like before the day, before you get credit for anything, you ran six miles. Yeah. As a pilot, do you? Because I was I was watching some videos of some pilots, you know, that I came across. Um, and do you guys like kind of have to stay in physical condition just to endure like flying a plane essentially? I mean, the physical f- fitness standards are universal across the Marine Corps. They're all the same. Mm. There is a um, there's a unique level of fitness that is associated with flying, and it kind of comes and goes with how much flying you're doing. Mm. But there's not like a separate type of aviation fitness other than there are things about aviation that will fatigue you that you you won't get fatigued doing other things, and, and that's true for other things as well. But like the PT in the Marine Corps, yeah. doesn't they don't care what your, your job is. Can, can, can you train for the, like let's say you did a disassociated tour and you weren't flying for 18 months, and now you knew you were going back to a squadron, you're gonna be flying. Is there any exercises that you could do to get ready for flying? You can't train for G tolerance, which is like <laughs> the big thing. So that's like, yeah. it's a perishable thing. You know, there's there's uh, you know aerobic and anaerobic, there's certain muscles that are good to, to, to be strengthened. Um, but if you haven't flown, it's the Gs that will, that you cannot train for. You can't replicate those Gs and you can't train for those Gs. At all? Well, no, no. I mean, okay, let me challenge you. Now you can train for the technique and you can right. strengthen the muscles to do that, but you can't replicate the actual feeling of the G's. But that being said, if you take someone that's in really good shape versus someone that's not in really good shape, the person that's in really good shape is going to do better. Maybe. I mean, okay. I mean, you have to use your muscles. Yeah, you, you do. But like larger muscles don't, don't mean better G tolerance. But uh, what about just conditioning? Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, absolutely. Yes, you, a better conditioned person is going to be able to endure all things being equal, be able to endure the rigors of flying more than the other person. But that doesn't mean he's going to have a higher G tolerance. Mm-hmm. Huh. Did I ever tell you about my my buddy? My, what, well, when my platoons all went backseat in the F 18s so we went through the whatever training you go through, so you can get called to go to the backseat. Mm-hmm. So we all go through, well he showed up late and so he missed the whole briefing on how to, what is it called, how to push the blood to your brain. He missed all that and then he missed whatever. 
And then he showed up. I think he was out. I think he was drinking the night before. <laughs> and so there's a little cover and move, and like we snuck him back into the class and put his name on the roster, and it's all good. Well, then he showed. He go, we get up to Fallon, and he didn't know what to do. He just got in the play, and he's like, "Cool, I know what you know, whatever." And he passed out the entire time. You know, he, he would just like wake up and then, then just pass out again because he didn't know to to put the blood to his head. He yep. didn't know to do that, so he's just passing out. And they had video of it. Does that yeah. make sense that they had video of it? Totally. He was just he was just flying. Of around in the, in the <laughs> cockpit <laughs> and and we were laughing and he's like I had no idea and he just didn't remember anything he was just passing out yep bro can't you get like hurt like that like if you're passed out on limp and can't your neck because you know those that video that you play at the muster of that guy in the what do you, what do you call those centrifuge. centrifuge yeah yeah and he he passes out and it's like bro he's still getting smashed from the the, the force yeah I don't think there's any real risk of permanent injury from doing that. It's more just being humiliated, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, that actually that's what I was that's what I meant. Like do you guys train do you guys have a specific like training routine for that? Because man, it, it you don't really realize it. I mean maybe you do, maybe you don't. You don't but when you see guys flying planes and doing all that stuff, you don't really understand like what you're going through physically in there, you know? Right. Is there an ideal physical build for fighter pilot? I don't think so, man. I mean, just like with every Marine, they're just all shapes and sizes. I mean, I, my my body type is drastically different than others. And um, well, if you were going to be a, an F-18 pilot or let's say an F-35 pilot, yeah. you were going to design an F-35 pilot human. Yeah. How tall would that human be? Six foot. How much How much would they weigh? 190 pounds. So that's it. Just like, so there is an ideal. That's because if he's 6'4", he's cramped in the cockpit. If he's six, if he's five, five, he can't reach the pedals or whatever, <laughs> right? I mean, there's issues. <laughs> there are there are legitimate anthropometric issues. That is a true thing. Like you get measured all these odd measurements, like ankle to, or, or like elbow to wrist, like ankle to knee. There's all sorts of physical measurements. the The window is pretty broad, mm -hmm. and even you know, for me to say six foot one ninety, I'm just talking about like a, a lean, strong guy. Does that mean a five foot six, 125 pound person can't be a good pilot? No, they totally, absolutely can, absolutely can. Would that person maybe struggle a little bit with like looking over their shoulder? Yeah, they would. Their body type is if you're six four and you're banging your head against the canopy, which guys in my squadron, guys whose call signs were stretched because they were so tall. At the end of the day, I don't think any would come back and say I'm better because of my build or my height. So even that answer is like. The, the window is broad enough to say mm -hmm. that anybody, and there's pilots out there that are plenty of good pilots out there that aren't six foot 190. Is there, is there a cutoff height or I minimum think standard? Technically, I, yeah, I think it's pretty small. I think it's it's very short, like five one, five two. You know, you can accommodate someone that short. And I think I, I've known guys that are six five, six six flying fighters. So dang, they get it, there's a big window in there. <laughs> do they call them pedals? They do, they pedals, really call them pedals up. now. Huh. They're adjustable, so the image of not being able to reach the pedals is more funny than anything. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, as a, as a taller guy, you know, a taller dude, and you know, when you get into an airplane that somebody else has flown and they're on the, the shorter side, you get in your, your, your yeah, knee, yeah. you know, it's like being in the backseat of a car and you immediately have to push those pedals all the way back because the dude in front of you is way shorter than you. So it's adjustable like a Cadillac. It is. <laughs> it's, yeah. The adjustment is not too far away from the, the cockpit temperature adjuster. Oh, that's right. So, you know, you got to adjust that little temperature. <laughs> Check. <laughs> All right, going on. I do not wish to discourage anyone who gets exercise from golf, tennis, bowling, hunting, fishing, gardening, walking, skiing, etc. In fact, I encourage such activities during off time. When spring arrives and long daylight hours of the year are with us, it's a good time to start physical training program. He goes on, a commander should have no objection to, to the closing of any headquarters at four o'clock, two days a week in order to devote this time to physical exercising, nor should he object to the stopping of other activities in most TOE units at four o'clock, two afternoons a week for this purpose. So he's talking about you should always train two days a week, which once again, I mean, I, in the Marine Corps, you guys do PT every single day, right? Well, not aviation units all oh, really? the time. Yeah, I mean, when I was with the ground units, that was every single day, mm -hmm. and there was a time allocated to that. Um, the squadrons that I would in, I was in, didn't do five day a week, five day a week PT. Huh. 
I thought that was pretty standard in the in the whole military. Well, that's what he's saying. He's saying only two days a week. Yeah, I mean, I think what he's saying is interesting because you mentioned the comment. This guy was, you know, steeped in World War One. This is a guy saying you need to prioritize time for PT. Now, I mean, two days a week. Now, looking back, as you know, reflecting on that, but he was probably a pioneer saying. Hey, commanders, shut your unit down to go work out. Yeah. And you should do that. Like, that's okay as opposed to, hey, we got to get this paperwork done or this whatever other thing going on is. So he might have been out in front of the curve for all I know for the for the era that he was in saying it's okay from the general down to the private. Is it shut down normal ops to go to unit PT? Uh, no, absolutely. I, you're 100, I believe you're 100% right. He was the guy that was spearheading yeah. working out. Look, you got to get out there two days a week. <laughs> He doesn't even say minimum, right? Because that would be sort of like, hey, minimum two days a week. He's just saying two days a week. Look, you got to get out there. Um, in connection with this physical exercise program, I think we might well give thought to delaying the evening meal on Monday through Friday in order to give the men more time to get cleaned up, showered, and dressed so they will not feel the or urge to rush right to work, well, right from work to supper. This was this uh, the reason I wanted to read the section is this would have advantages other than physical conditioning by serving the evening meal in the enlisted messes as early as we do we leave the soldier with over six hours of time after supper before he is scheduled to be in bed to do things that sometimes lead to trouble more exercise in a later meal hour in the afternoon would tend to reduce free time in the evening and would absorb energies and would encourage the men to go to bed earlier. It has been found to be an overall advantage to serve the heavy meal at night instead of at noon on duty days. I believe we give enough time off to our food service people so they can live with these changes in the feeding program. <laughs> oh, it's so classic. Awesome. Alcohol. I've written before, chapter three, about the intemperate use of alcohol and, the, and of the desirability of cutting down on the quantity of consumption of alcohol. One of the reasons for this is to help improve the physical condition of our officers and men. Obesity, I would like to say a word about personnel being overweight. While there are not very many such personnel in most commands, there are some who are eating more than their physical activity burns up. The commander should bring this to the attention of such individuals with a view to more exercising or less eating or both. Other pro problems, and this is the last section, other problems, this is just a broad statement. This is, this, this is actually something that Echo that you used to say all the time on this podcast. Other problems, I believe that such a program as I suggested will automatically help to solve the problem in those units which have one of men in garrison changing out of fatigues for evening social activities. It should help reduce other unfavorable statistics as well. You used to say on this podcast all the time, Echo, that the most universally helpful thing that a person can do is exercise. Mm -hmm. It will help you in all aspects of whatever you're doing, mm. which is a good point. And what he's saying is, hey, if you exercise, you, every problem that you have is going to be improved. Yeah. There you go. So Echo was the pioneer on that one. There, there's something you said I was thinking about in my, my contrast between aviation, my, my time in a fighter squadron versus my time in Anglica, which is kind of the biggest contract. Uh, contrast is, and I don't know I, how, how it is elsewhere, but the infantry or the ground units when I was with them have a kind of pretty regimented, like their day is a, it's kind of a typical work day. Mm -hmm. Whereas a fighter squadron operates 24 hours a day. So they're, they are running in shifts the whole time. Mm -hmm. So a standard work week is there's always a third or a half of the unit there from Sunday night till Friday afternoon. So that cycle is a little, it's in, I was kind of thinking in my head of just the, 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 getting the whole unit together in a, in a squadron almost never happens. Mm -hmm. You're at best, you're going to have like, even when you're doing your workup, you run in that. Workup is workup is probably even worse because workups, you know, the flying schedule shifts around a bunch to get all these different quals. But you, I would say, routinely, the best you're ever going to get is half your squadron there at any given time. Most of the time, now it's not always like that, but I would say ninety percent of a typical fighter squadron cycle is you have two or three shifts, and you'll never have more than half your squadron there at any given time. Hmm. Well, before the war in the nineties. At the team, we used to PT as a team five days a week. Yeah. As a team. Maybe one day would be what they call the individual PT, which guys would legitimately individual PT. They'd go do whatever, you know, do jujitsu or whatever they were going to do. 
But the other days it was like, oh, Monday's a run, Tuesday's a swim, Wednesday's individual PT, Thursday's, oh, of course, Friday's Monster Mash. That was kind of a typical st- schedule at the, in the day, back in the What's the Monster Mash? Monster Mash is just, oh, course, boat paddle, just c- come up with some crazy sort of various, what would you call it? I don't know what you, it, it'd be like one of those, um, you ever see those TV uh, physical competitions where they're doing all these, op- like you'd run the obstacle course, then you would do berm runs, but you would be in a little team. So it'd just be some kind of, I don't know, we called it a monster match. Like American Ninja Warrior? Yeah, like American like Ninja Warrior, but as teams. Gotcha. And is, is the platoon back in the, this is obviously pre-war, but back in, was the platoon kind of together all the time? Yeah, so the platoon was together, but the team wasn't. So there'd be right. two platoons out in the desert. There'd be a, no, there'd be one platoon out of the desert. There'd be one platoon up at Fallon. There'd be another platoon in the jungle somewhere. But there'd still be three platoons back at the team and all the support people from the team. So the, the, the platoon is like that was the element that at the lowest level, like they were together. You didn't really break up platoons very often. Not very often. Yeah, that's cool. You're going through your work up together, but you gotta remember a SEAL platoon is small. Right. A SEAL platoon is only 16 guys. Yeah. Sometimes in the past we bumped them up to 18. Sometimes we've even bumped them up to 21, depending on manning and personnel and mission. But the general SEAL platoon, 16 people. And post, post-war, did that become, the task unit was together? For the most part, yes. they, they almost like elevate up that the yes. The, they, then they all of a sudden they they made the task unit, which is two platoons together with a headquarters unit over it, and they and they had the idea. It took them a while to like actually make it happen. So there was some good vision on the on behalf of naval special warfare commanders to mm-hmm. say actually you know what we should probably put a bigger unit together yeah. because sixteen guys is is very limiting, right? What can you do with 16 guys? I mean, if you man up vehicles with 16 guys, you man up whatever, you man up three vehicles, now you now there's six people in those vehicles. Driver, gunner, driver, gunner, driver, gunner. You put the rest of the guys in there, that gives you 10 assaulters. What can you take down with 10 assaulters? The answer is not very many. So went into a task unit mode with now you had two platoons, plus you had headquarters, and then you get attachments of EOD, and maybe you get a some kind of a radio man to help you out. So all of a sudden, you know, you got mm, 35 or 40 guys going out the door. So it turns into a, a better situation. It was yeah. a really good call. I remember one of the, one of the first things, uh, I was in a platoon, I was in an ARG platoon, which meant we were going out on a ship and we had to do hydrographic reconnaissance, which is old school, lead line and slate. Lead line and slate, meaning you had a lead line, you had a piece of rope with a piece of lead on the bottom and you you tied little knots every six feet for fathoms and you would go and swim in a line and dip that lead line and see how deep the water was and then you'd dive for obstacles before the Marines came in. This is World War II, straight up, UDT, underwater demolition team stuff. Well, when you're in the ARG platoon, you actually did that a lot because you were supporting Marine Corps landings. So, so we, were, we had a 16-man platoon. And I did an ARG like that with 16 guys, and it was really hard because you, you have a boat party of guys, and then you have like a radio man. So there's two or three guys that aren't in the water, and somebody's staying with the boat, so there's another two guys that are not in the water. So all of a sudden, you've, got, you've only got seven guys to do the recon or nine guys to do the recon or whatever. So that's that's not good. So I remember writing a point paper. I was like an E4 and I wrote a point paper to my commanding officer that the ARG platoons should have four more personnel in the platoon. And uh, I think we actually got like, they gave us like two more guys. Pretty cool. Young. I mean, who did I think I was? <laughs> Such a. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I look back at that now. It's like standard naval letter format when I, I sent it to your. I know I tried. Yeah. I know I tried, but the cool thing was, you know, my commanding officer at the time was like, "Yeah, you know, that makes sense. Hey, well, we can't give you four, but we can give you two. Make it an eighteen-man platoon. We had an eighteen-man platoon. I'm pretty sure. I can't even remember. You know what's weird is I can't even remember what. Yeah, I, I can't remember if he gave us two more people. Maybe gave us one more. I think he gave us at least one more person because I think I know exactly who it was. But anyways. All right, so there's the physical conditioning thing. Um, the next section is called Chapter 12, The Creating of Superior Units. 
four basic principles. I have found that there are four basic principles which apply to the problem of creating army units which are considered superior. First, the superior unit must be created from the ordinary run of personnel. How awesome is that? You're gonna make a superior unit, but anybody that's ever served in the military knows that you're gonna get what you get. And yet, we all know that there's units that are freaking awesome and there's units that are horrible. And both the awesome units and the horrible units have run-of-the-mill people in them. They came from the. They come from the same pool of soldiers in this case. It's yeah. all the same people. You yeah. don't get to pick your, your little team of yeah. your superstar athletes in this case. Uh, and it's the same thing in business, right? It's the same thing in business. You get businesses that are in the same market and one of them is crushing and the other one's not. Well, why is that? Why is that? You're both getting to hire from the same group of human beings in, in the country, whatever country you're in. So the superior unit must be created from the ordinary run of personnel. Second, classified according to ability, the men in a unit fall naturally into three groupings, upper, middle, and lower. The excellence of a unit depends upon the ability of the commander to bring the men of the lower group to a degree of proficiency which makes them an asset to his unit team. So this is, we're gonna get into some stuff where I'm, I'm not sure about. I'm not sure about, and this is one of them. And he talks about a little bit more. I mean, he talks about your focus being making the people that are, he's basically saying you got good, really good people, middle people, and bad people. He's saying the focus is like, make the bad people better. Make the bad people a, 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 a plus for the unit. I don't necessarily agree with that. I, I agree with that uh, should be a, a focus, a singular focus. I don't think it should be the full. I would rather take my people that are up the top and make them totally awesome and make my people that are in the middle like really, really good. I'm not going to focus my efforts on the turds. Yeah. <laughs> The, the reason I didn't say anything when you when you read that because I had a little like mm, uh -huh. is I'm gonna listen to what General Clark has to say before yeah. I get done it. But but at on its face though when you said that my first instinct was was uh, okay I don't think that's right. But mm -hmm. I'm, obviously he's gonna say something about it. But we we get this question in business all the time. Is is they leaders will devote all their attention to their bottom performers like almost all of their attention. It's like why would you invest all of your time? in your least productive people. Why wouldn't you invest most of your most of your time in your most productive people? Yeah. Again, you don't you don't ignore those people, but if yeah. you're devoting and again, let, uh, he's going to say something, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But when you said that, I had that reaction of, huh. Well, it's like if you let's say on a on a level of 1 to 5, you're a 5 and Echo's a 1. 1 being the worst, 5 being the best. <laughs> sure. Of course. Yeah. So if I take my efforts and I'm able to I'm able to double your power. I can turn you into a 10. I can only turn Echo into a two. Exponentially positive returns on Dave Burke. Yeah. Kind of not on Echo Charles. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just say less. All right, next. Third, all men to dis this is such a, this is such an interesting one. Third, all men desire to do what is wanted of them. All men Desire to do what is wanted of them. Okay, so that's that's the first part. So let's let's absorb that, and then he goes on to just take some ownership here. When they do not, it is because they have not been adequately motivated and instructed. So, have you ever had anybody in your squadron that straight up just didn't want to do what was what was wanted of them? You know, I would say yes in the sense that, yeah, there are people that I've had in my units that fit that bill, and we did something about that. His point, I understand his point, though, and the idea that, that I'm going to write that person off as unwilling to do it, to me, it's it was more of like, how, how much of my t how much energy am I going to devote to try to find the way that gets you to where you need to be? So while I don't disagree with that comment... Yeah, I've had people in my in my sphere multiple times throughout my career that simply didn't get where they needed to be, mm -hmm. and 
Could you say, hey, that's the fault of the leader? Yes, 100%. But the leader also still has to make a little measurement of, am I going to devote 100% of my time to getting that guy from a one to a two? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to go, hey, man, this investment in you right now is going to take away from all this other stuff, and I'm going to cut you loose. Yeah, and by the way, what's what's 10 times zero if the person's a zero? Well, now, so, so listen, I think all men is an overstatement. I think you could throw a percentage on there that's upwards of 97%. Yeah. 97% that want to do what they want to do a good job. Yeah. They want to do a good job. And to his point, as a leader, your default should be is they're not the problem. Your default to Absolutely. be is the percentage is so high that you might as well just go in the assumption that the problem isn't with them. So that 97% is is I think actually correct, not all. But I think his point too is like, hey, if you're in charge of people and they're not they're not up to standards, you need to spend most of your time figuring out what you're doing wrong. Yeah, most people don't need to be fired, they need to be led. To think we wrote that in extreme ownership <laughs> or in dichotomy of leadership. I think it's in dichotomy of leadership. Most people don't need to be fired, they need to be led. Most people. Yeah. All people, no, you're no. gonna get, and you know what, I, you know when you see this, and I don't, well, you didn't get to see this because you were an officer and you went through OCS. When you go through, like Navy boot camp, you see some people that don't want to be there. <laughs> like they, they do not want to be there. They're there for 15 minutes. They're like, this ain't for me. And they're going to do whatever they got to do to get. They don't want to do what is wanted of them. Right. They don't. Yeah. They want out. Uh, fourth, the best unit in an organization is always the one which is excellent or better in all things. If you agree with these precepts, let us analyze and and apply them to the basic problem of the commander who is striving for a superior unit. Application to the units, applications of the principles to the unit. The problems of polishing ordinary units until they emerge as superior are primarily the problems of raising individual performance and capabilities to a superior level. The many truly outstanding units which have been produced in our army give give ample evidence that these problems can be solved. Based on the fact that their percentile scores on the AFQT, which is like the ASVAB, which is the, it's the basic intelligence test that you take when you're coming in the military as an enlisted guy. Do you take it to become an officer, the ASVAB? Yeah, yeah. No, I took took the ASVAB. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So you take like a basic test. It's sort of an SAT, an ACT type test. Totally. How smart are you is basically what it is. And then he ranks it out into three groups. And it's the upper third, the middle third, the lower third. But he's got this little thing in here, and he's got the scores listed, and I'm not going to go into those. But the upper third is 11% and 34. So the upper, the top two groups combined make up 45%. So 45% of people are in the are in the 65 percentile and higher of that testing. 43% 43% are in the middle. So you're almost done. And then the last 12% is people that are in not the lowest group, but the second to the lowest group. So if you get between zero and nine on the on the ASVAB, and these aren't, this is, this is actually the AFQT, which is the old ASVAB. So the scores won't correlate to what we know about since we didn't take the ASVAB in 19, or we didn't take the AFQT in 1958. So what he's saying is you're gonna get mostly people that are either in the middle group or in the higher group, which is great. Now, I'm sure that there's some people that are thinking, well, that's the difference, you know? I, you know, I'm in the civilian world and we get these people, they're, they're, they're not, no. When you start talking about people that are in the lowest scoring brackets of the, of the ASVAB, like they, they can't get in the military, but they're also not gonna be applying for a job with, that's gonna take some, some high level cognitive abilities. They're, they're just not gonna be there. So I've got a very interesting book that I'm going to cover on the podcast, and and it's it's really it's I've been reading it for a while. I've actually I actually showed it to you several months ago because I've been stewing on it. But it's during the Vietnam War they they needed people. Yeah. They needed people to be in the military. They needed people to be in the military to go to Vietnam, and so. They started to lower the standards, and the the main standard that they lowered was the the IQ level, or I don't know if you want to call it the IQ level, but that's basically what's the intellectual level, the 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 intelligence level. And they started getting these these people in the military that were 
just they just didn't have the mental capacity to to do really any job um even and you know you, you know you think about in the military there's some pretty there's some pretty there's some jobs that don't take a lot of intellectual horsepower right i mean you need people that are going to clean the the toilets you know you got you got some you know you got a people that are going to and look these are what we this is what i did when i got in the military right when i got the seal teams i was cleaning toilets but then you you're you're going to move up and you're going to move on but at some place you need some people that are going to have some pretty fundamentally non high cognitive skill requirement jobs well they started letting people in that just didn't have the capability it's a really sad and these guys a lot of these guys went to vietnam they had a, obviously they had a higher casualty rate they had a higher more of them got killed uh, because they just didn't they just didn't understand things and the, the guy that wrote this book that i'm reading he went, he's talking about going through boot camp and he basically gets paired up with one of these guys and all the drill instructors knew it they they called them like McNamara's morons. That's what they'd call these guys when they'd come in. And he got assigned one of these guys basically to 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 help get him through boot camp. And one of the most like one of the opening scenes is they're telling him, "Hey, you know, write write your address on this postcard and write a message to your family." And not only did he not know how to write, but he didn't even know what his address was. He, he didn't even know what his what street he lived on it didn't he didn't know they had to teach him how to tie his shoes and and they had to teach him how to tie his shoes not just hey this is how you do it no like they had to teach him for extended periods of time how to tie his shoes so these are people that are really in a co- really in a in a low intellectual level and we we brought i think it was about 100,000 of them into the military which is just un just just horrible just horrible. Um, so my point in saying all that is, we're talking about, you know, you, in, in in the civilian sector, you're not getting that person either to apply for your job in accounting, right? So don't think to yourself, well, you know, my accounting department, that my guys, my people are there. They don't, have, they're not smart either. No, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about that. Um, so he goes on to say that. <clears throat> Those in the upper groupings are the best educated and quickest to learn, can be well motivated, but need to be challenged to develop their full potential. The middle groupings are average run of American youth. They are easily controlled. Take well to discipline, learn easily, respond to good leadership, but are usually capable of more, and they must be pushed. The lower groupings are the ones that need special attention. And again, this is where you and I are kind of like, hmm, the lower groupings are the ones who need special attention. The disciplinary problem in this group is higher than average. I agree with that. The individuals require special motivation and instruction. I agree with that. Their attitude constitutes a special barometer of the esprit de corps of the unit. This group contains also many of the misfits who, if they cannot be assimilated, assimilated must be eliminated. So... It's interesting that that he's calling for like special attention on this lower group, uh, and then he says, "In a single squad crew, go." Well, I was just, I'm thinking in my mind as I'm hearing you talk about this, just things that I've heard you say on this podcast, things we've talked about on your podcast, and and I'm I'm trying to kind of consider what's in General Clark's head as I'm hearing this. Obviously, I'm trying to put myself in his position. Mm-hmm. You know, we've talked about this before, and I I think the way you said it was. Anybody on your team has the potential to undo your entire plan. You know, and so I'm, I'm trying to make this connection in my head of the things he's talking about, why you would devote so much effort to these people. And, I, and I'm, I'm just trying to place in my head why he's saying it the way he's saying it, which there is, if they're on your team and you keep them on your team, these aren't people you get rid of, but they're on your team and they are underperformers or low performers, they still have the potential of undoing your plan. And so I'm, I'm trying to piece the things that he's thinking almost in, I don't know what he's going to say, but I do understand that, you, you know, the flip side of that, the other thing I've been thinking about, we work with companies that some of the companies we work with have this philosophy is, hey, we're going to pay more and we're going to attract a higher, higher, higher bar, a higher average level because we are a higher paying organization. So we're going to, and you know, there's a bunch of economic theory behind that. And their belief is that they're going to attract better talent. And you know what they end up with? the exact same problems as all other organizations. They still have a bell curve. They still have underperformers. And this is something you said too, is even in the SEAL teams and people create this image on their mind of 
what a seal is and they're you know they're super, superhuman and how many times have you said no they're people the exact same thing at top gun where people place these guys on a pedestal as if they're somehow all of them uniquely capable and we had a bottom 12 percent at top gun too mm-hmm. we had underperformers at top gun just like everywhere else so the for me to think about it if you're in a leadership role the takeaway from this is that what is required for all this is your leadership more than anything. Now, I'll, I'll, I do want to hear his thoughts on that, but your underperformance can, can still undo your plan. And there's no like free pass of, hey, we just have a better screening process. So we don't we weed out those people. Well, we know that that's not true. Those problems exist in the same bell curve in any, every organization. Yeah, and the other thing that affects the bell curve is the bar that everyone has to be staying above. So. The bottom 12% at, at Top Gun, they're the bottom 12% at Top Gun. They may be the top tier of some other organization somewhere, but at Top Gun, they're the bottom 12%, and, and they're making the same kind of mistakes relative yes. to their job. It's the same thing in the SEAL teams. Like, oh, yeah, the, the SEAL teams, they have a, we have a bottom part of the bell curve. Now, those people might be really good if they had some other job somewhere, mm-hmm. You know, in Task Unit Bruiser, we we had to get rid of one guy. It was a great guy. He was a hard worker. He just didn't quite have the capacity to get the job done. I guarantee he went to his next unit in the Navy and was the best sailor they had. I, I can I can I can guarantee that because he was a hard worker. He wanted to do a good job. He just didn't, didn't quite have that decision making process. And maybe I shouldn't have said the best sailor, but he's going to be a really good guy. A really good guy. And and so, but the bar yeah. is 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 higher for what you're being required to do, right? This is what you're like at Top Gun. You're being required to fly this jet at these at these G's and make these decisions and maneuver and remember what's happening and debrief and communicate and and pay attention to nine different things at the same. You're required to do all that stuff. And the the people that are barely able to do it, they're the bottom of the bell curve. You put them, you know, driving an Uber, and they're going to be the best freaking Uber driver, you know, yeah. in, in well, at least in the top, let's say, the top five percent of Uber drivers. Yeah. Because I've had some damn good Uber drivers before. So, so yes, that that bell curve exists everywhere. You're not going to get away from it, and you do have to lead. And I and I agree with your point. Why General Clark might be saying, "Hey, you got to pay attention to that bottom twelve percent." Because no one in the top 88% is going to, well, there's a much less chance, there's much less chance of them torpedoing your whole mission. Right. Those knuckleheads, they, they're holding the freaking trigger to the torpedo and they could fire that thing <laughs> off at any moment. So you got to pay attention to them. That might be the, the, the genesis of his, of his focus on these individuals. Is that probably where the what's the saying? You're only as strong as your weakest link, kind of a yeah. philosophy, yep. right? Yep. Yeah, maybe that's where it came from. It's it's from that definitely from that concept, that yeah. broad concept. Yeah. <clears throat> He goes on here, a single squad crew or section will probably contain men of all three groupings. Certainly they will appear in any platoon or company. This presents a practical problem in the handling and instructing of men in perfecting the teamwork of the squad crew section or platoon. The leader can afford to adopt only one approach to handling his men. He must assume that they all want to do what he wants done. When any number do not respond to this assumption, The fault is more probably his than theirs. (laughs) So his assumption is everyone wants, that's a great assumption to make. The assumption, and that's what I like about this assumption that all men want to do what what is wanted them to do, what what we want them to do. That's a great assumption to make because that means when they don't, it's our fault. And that's exactly what he's saying. He's taking full ownership. And then he says, this is like almost word for word for something that I brief almost on a daily basis to companies. If they don't respond, he should check his procedures instructions and subordinate leaders to determine where in lies the trouble. When only one or two individuals are involved, punitive action or elimination may be indicated. So if you've got a platoon or a company, you've got a company of 150 people and everyone gets it except for two guys, okay. Well, maybe I need to check those two guys and maybe I need to get rid of them, but if you've got whatever, 
20 people that don't understand what they're supposed to be doing, guess what? It's on you. We arrive now at the fourth precept. The best unit in the organization is always the one which is excellent or better at all things, which is based upon the premise that no unit commander has enough time to make his unit superior in all things at all times. How, therefore, should he spread his efforts? It's obvious that his unit must be proficient in marksmanship, communication, supply, administration, tactics, physical fitness, techniques, maintenance, etc., etc., etc. If his unit is not proficient in any one of these things, his team is not sound and will fail him when the test comes. How then must he manage? So we got all these things and you obviously can't be, and he's he's making a difference or, or making a, uh, um, a break between superior, which means you're awesome at this thing, and being good at it. First, he should avoid putting too much stress on any one thing so as to overemphasize it in order to make a show of it. If he practices this method, he will do so at the expense of other important things. This is a common error. So you're not, you shouldn't be the master of anything. You should be the jack of all trades. Second, he must stress adequately all of the many facets of the training job. Even though he is not an expert in each, he must direct a subordinate to be an expert, and the commander must then supervise and check his subordinate's work. The latter is important. So you're not gonna be an expert. As the leader, you're not gonna be the expert. You got some you got some nugs under you that are gonna be the expert in that thing. Next section is called motivation. Woven into the entire pattern are the threads of motivation. This motivation is manifestly important because it comes from a spree, enthusiasm, morale, effort, competition, and accomplishment. The people in each of the top, middle, and lower groupings need to be motivated in different ways and in varying degrees, which is a little different than when he said earlier, says the leader can only afford to adopt the one approach when handling his men. Little little dichotomy. You got different people, they're gonna get motivated in different ways. In encouraging students to learn, we motivate them by one or more of the following. One, show a need. Two, develop an interest. Both those are explaining why. Right, this is why this is important. This is what the need is. Here's how you get someone to develop an interest in something. You explain to them how it's gonna help them. Maintain the interest, that's also explaining why. And then he's got some other things, encouraging early success, giving recognition and credit, using competition, giving rewards, awarding punishments. These same things may be used to incite a body of men or a military unit into action. Undoubtedly, every commander sometime during his career, after being assigned a difficult task, has soon soon thereafter considered how he would present this task to his subordinates, how he would appeal them to get the job done. In short, on what he would base his efforts to motivate them to tackle the job with the will necessary to attain the goal sought. He will probably use many factors to motivate his unit. Some of them may be specifically mentioned and some may be implied. For instance, except as a last resort, he would not mention punishment in the case of failure. His men would know him well enough to know that he would not stand for failure. The real art in motivating a group of men to accomplish a common mission is to reach each man in such a way that all men in the unit are incited to the extent of their several capabilities. Of course, the kind of mission to be performed by the men will be will determine the motivating factors used, but there is one element that must be kept in mind, and that is that no amount of motivation will incite a man to undertake zealously that which he knows is manifestly beyond his capabilities. So big chunk about motivation there. And you know, I I was talking, I can't remember if it was a client or if it was EF Online the other day. Um, But you know, when you get told the, the, the proverbial you know, you get tasked with something that doesn't make any sense, and the boss just says, "Yo, sh- shut up and have your team do it." And then, what do you do? How do you how do you handle that? What do you say to the troops? And and I'm like, I will find a reason why all day long. That is awesome. You know, I will go, and I'm not gonna lie to him. I'm gonna say, "Hey, listen, boss just told us this is how we're doing it, and you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna knock this thing out of the park." That way. I'm gonna build some trust with the boss. He's gonna realize that we can get the job done. When he realizes that we can get the job done, he's gonna start to listen to me. Once he starts to listen to me, I'm gonna get this changed. So right now, we're gonna crush this thing. And the guys go, yes. Or I'm gonna say, hey look, no one else is able to do this. We're the only people that can get this done. The boss knows it, we know it, so we're gonna knock this thing out of the park. 
Like, I'm gonna figure out a reason. There's gotta be a reason why that makes sense to do this thing. And believe me, if I can't find a reason that we're getting told to do something that makes no sense whatsoever, is gonna get people unnecessarily wounded or killed or it's unethical or it's immoral or it's illegal. That's what's going on. Otherwise, I can figure out a reason. And I'm talking about a good, I'm not talking about making something up to trick people. I'm talking about I will figure out a good freaking reason to go forward and make this happen. And that's what you need to do as a boss. That's that's why the why is so important. <sighs> Talks about awards. In the army, we use freely a system of awards and prizes in order to motivate men. Too often, these go to the men in the top of the upper group. They provide no incentive for improvement to those in the lower group and little for those in the middle group because the men know that the award is beyond their ability to achieve. These prizes make good articles for the unit papers, but their overall effect on the unit is negligible. It is well to recognize the outstanding men And we do this through proficiency pay and promotion. However, our system awards must go beyond this recognition of individuals. This is a great point. You know, so often we're sitting there rewarding the people that are kind of doing well who actually probably don't need any additional motivation. Look, should we recognize them? Absolutely. But what are we doing for the the middle group and even the lower group to make sure that they're feeling like they're moving forward in a positive way? Yeah, you know when you're like in elementary school and mm-hmm. you have like the award for most improved, mm. that's like kind of alleviates that issue, right? A little bit, because usually it's like someone in the middle, maybe even the bottom. A lot of the times, where yeah. you still get that cool like trophy or award yeah. or whatever, could, because mm. you improved so much. Mm-hmm. Is that Rather, a little backhanded smack, though? Like, I, g- I guess you Would could. You rack up some most improved. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten it before, yes. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it is, though. I don't think it's a, a backhanded cool. thing because it's true. Like, you know, when you get, like, um, uh, you know, MVP of the football game, it's always the same guy, the quarterback, or whatever. The guy, in, you know, d- obviously depends on the yeah. team. but It's like, that guy that's – he's already training, by the way, he, and he's already talented and gifted and he's working hard and he's focused. Yeah, yeah. and it, the ward – the guys in the middle, you do run that risk big time where it's like the guys in the middle is like, oh, yeah, well, I, I don't even have an expectation of the award, you know. But <laughs> if you get if you get most improved, bro, you can get most improved. That's good. Yeah. You know, especially if everyone respects it, because everyone typically does respect yeah. that if you're improving. I had uh, there's something called a Navy Achievement Medal. Did you ever get a Navy Achievement Medal? So Navy Achievement Medal is like, you know, it's it's sort of like a, it's a it's a strong pat on the back, we'll say. And you know, you might, you might get one when something happens, you know, yeah. you're a young enlisted guy. I think I had six Navy Achievement Medals, which is totally ridiculous. I would get those things all the time but from what, like. What's it for though? Like, Oh, action. I would run a communications course. when I, th- These are all from the 90s. It'd be like, yeah. you know, Petty Officer Willink ran an outstanding, you know, communications yeah. course. He organized, led, and developed the blah, 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 blah. Nam. Stoner <laughs> used to like laugh every time I put my, my dress uniform on because I had five Navy Achievement Medals. <laughs> <laughs> like the big rack of stars across my Navy, across my Nams. Get yeah. some. Yeah. Good. But I, I feel like, like I no, but I feel like I was kind of that guy. <laughs> like I was working hard, yeah. and they were just giving me awards, and I was like, "Cool, whatever. I don't care. I didn't care at all." Yeah, I wasn't like, "Hey, check well, out my names, <laughs> boy." <yeah. laughs> well, then okay, then I guess if you kind of go into it, I mean, in all kinds of environments, right? There's all kinds of different awards like that that are that are you can get without being the top like producer mm. or whatever like you got okay you got most improved then you got like hardest worker or something like that you know how you did know did you ever was, get that one no okay i was not even say. close <laughs> as far as like expectations of metal that was that was one i never really expected. but the but you get those how many nams do you have dave one what did you get a nam for <laughs> i got an end of tour nam Dang. So, so you, was this when you were like an ensign or a, or yeah, a second yeah. lieutenant? First or tour. Uh, yeah, first first tour in a squadron. So 
as you're thinking, I was, uh, la- I'm was i laughing because, th- you know, when you're talking about even the way you're saying NAM, like anybody in the Navy and the Marine Corps knows like the NAM is like this thing, this Navy Achievement Medal is, is like. And I racked up five of those totally. things, bro. But, you know, something that's something that's actually cool that you said is there's a couple different ways to view, like the award system in the military it can be a little questionable. There's people who can kind of peel that back and go, man, is that is that legit or not? We had two different categories of the same award. We had what we called an end of tour award, which went, okay, you know, Petty Officer Willink has been with us for three years. He's leaving the, the squad or the unit or whatever, and he's going, and we want to recognize his body of work. It's kind of like a participation award. It doesn't have a ton of meaning other than you survived your three years. We want to thank you on your way out. There was something else we called was an impact NAM, mm. or we had a term called a spot. drive-by NAM. Oh, we called them a spot NAM. Yeah, I think, same, same I think thing. it was so called just, a spot Just NAM. the same. It's the same thing. I was racking up spot Which NAMs means, like it was going out of style. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to make this, this make this serious at this five nams but the point behind that is like you can take a middle of the road dude middle road guy who's who's not your all-star quarterback not your top tier guy and he's over there doing some good work yes so maybe that was me, dude. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Tra- they were trying to encourage Five's me. a bit ridiculous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I don't have five of anything. But <laughs> no, there is it's a good. way to, to when, you, when you recognize somebody for their work, it's a heck of a lot better to recognize them for something they're doing when we call the impact or the mm. spot as opposed to, well, you've been with us for five years. Yeah. You get a watch. Like yeah. that's our thing. Yeah. So here's your here's your. You've been here for five years, as opposed to hey, that thing you did, that specific thing. If you can recognize people for that, the, the, in in this leadership little s- system you're trying to create is, mm. it's really good to recognize people for the work that they do when they do it, as opposed to, well, we just sort of have this process that by yeah. these wickets or these little checkpoints you get recognition, yeah. which over time sort of undermines the value of it. Yeah. And and again, fives. A, well, yeah. that's a lot, the, dude. But the NAM is not. A, I mean, you're talking about straight up, essentially, a participation trophy. Like, you, oh, you've been here five years. My NAM was a participation award. Up. I was leaving. Captains got NAMs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't care if you were the number one captain or the number twelve captain. When you yeah. left, oh, yeah. you got a NAM. Good and. Job. And the number one guy didn't, guy didn't go, well, I actually earned this one. And the number 12 guy didn't think, well, this is garbage. It had no real meaning. Yeah, the the impact, what'd you call it? Uh, uh, spot The Nam. Spot Nam. I think it was called the Spot that's a, that's There's a lot more legitimacy to that than, hey, thanks for being here. Dude, yeah. Yeah. So you got a look on your face, bro, like you're all fired up for my man. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the thing. But you, that's a perfect point right there. Because if, they're, if a Spot Nam and a regular participation trophy Nam is the same sort of thing, then it's like, oh wait, you got to differentiate those two because if you're over here yeah, saying you got five, there is a differentiation NAMs. on the NAM that is you can get a V, which is when it becomes a combat award. Yeah. So a NAM with a combat V or a, a combat Com. distinguishing device is what yeah. they call it. So it has a V on it, yeah. and that's that's a legit award. And I a lot of guys in Tasking a Bruiser got NAMs with Vs. And those NAMs with Vs that the guys got in Task Unit Bruiser were hard earned. They weren't like, oh, you're just gonna, you were you. There was some gunfire near, but no, like these guys were in 18 firefights and they got a NAM with a V. Yeah. And and you know the some of the guys in in Task Unit Bruiser, some of Stoner's guys, they got the R Com, which is the Army Commendation Medal with a V. Yep. And that was a huge deal because yeah. those things are tough to and, get. The Marine that, Corps does not came, give out those things. And that came from the uh, from the Army. Recognizing yes. what you were doing, which which added that, which added to that as well. Yep. There's a couple things in the military that have a little bit of sanctity. The V, yep. whether it's a NAM, a COM, whatever it is, the V that has there, there's me. You can't just get a V. Mm-hmm. You got to earn that combat distinguishing device. The other one in the Marine Corps that it shouldn't say the Marine Corps, Navy, and the Marine Corps is what we call the CAR, the Combat Action Ribbon. Mm-hmm. They don't like to just you don't just. That's not a participation award. You you got to earn that car. Yeah, and the CIB in the army, which is exactly. the combat infantry, infantry badge, badge yeah. which means you you you've been in combat. Yes. Yeah, the, and that's that's what that's what Hackworth called out uh, the admiral for Admiral Borda for right. wearing a combat V on his NAM. It was actually a, I think it was it was a NAM with a V on it. And he and Hackworth said this guy was in Vietnam, but he wasn't. He was on a ship. He wasn't in direct combat with the. And Admiral Borda killed himself. Yeah, 
over this drama over a, it's crazy now that I'm you know we're sitting here laughing you're like oh this we can't ever get serious again all we have to do is talk about Admiral Borda yeah. and 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 Colonel Hackworth calling him out for wearing a combat V and he kills himself in the Navy yard back to your five nams though. Mm-hmm. if some of those were like for some solid work you did on this little thing mm-hmm that you thought maybe wasn't that huge of a deal, but you did some good work and people mm-hmm. saw what you did and you're like, hey, hey, look, you didn't save the world, but you did really good with that little whatever you did. That's different than a participation trophy type situation. Bruh, all fired up, I'm, I was stoked, you know, I was trying to work hard, trying to do a good job and people were giving me cool recognition and I appreciated it. I'm just saying yeah. when you fast forward it from 1995 to like 2009, and we're back from Ramadi and I'm putting my dress uniform on and Stoner sees me and he's and we're laughing because I have five nams, which is really ridiculous. It's, it's also especially ridiculous because I was an officer and it's like an officer, is, if you're an officer, you got five. I mean, Dave Burke, you know, who was in the Marine Corps for 24 years had one nam yeah. and there I was walking around with five. That's kind of, it's just it's something funny, funny about yeah, it. Yeah, it is. So, they, so uh, to the officers and chiefs that gave me recognition as a young enlisted guy, I appreciate it. Uh, it, it meant a lot to me, but over time it did become a little bit funny and a little bit ridiculous that I was walking around with five nams. I'm gonna have to now post a picture. I don't think I have any of this stuff anymore, but. I realize that I'm probably coming off as nam obsessed at this mm-hmm. point. You are a little bit. But, or should I say and. I'm gonna write you up for one. <laughs> so you ever got employee of the month at, you know, your j- I was your in the job? military my whole life, but I never No, you worked job. at Wendy's. Oh you yeah, Wendy's. I was never employee of the month at Okay, Wendy's. but isn't that the same thing? Employee of the month. I would rather get a NAM than employee of the month at Wendy's. But it's the same thing. It's just not in the military, you see what I'm saying? It's a similar thing. NAMs were harder to get than employee of the month. There was no guarantee that a NAM was being issued. Right. Employee of the month is going to be issued. They got to choose somebody. Mm -hmm. But still, same deal as far as like the structure, you see what I'm saying? Where it's like you're getting awarded for something you did, even though in your mind it might not be that big of a deal. But as an individual like process, it's kind of a thing. It's something. It's just not nothing, you see. We'll go with it. We'll go with it. <laughs> All right, back to the book. Summary and conclusion, the job of those of us who are privileged to command to create superior units from the run of the from the ordinary run of manpower made available to us. This manpower falls into upper, middle, and lower groups about equal in strength that have different capabilities, present different problems, and need to be handled differently. All of the men in a unit must be assumed to desire to do what is wanted, and when they do not, they have not been properly handled and instructed. And I would add the word led there. The best and most reliable unit is usually the one that is excellent in all things, even though it might not be superior in any way. So that's the difference. He he breaks out the hierarchy of adjectives, the highest adjective being superior, and then below that is excellent, and excellent is better to be at excellent at everything than superior in one thing. Throughout the whole job runs the problem of motivation. This problem is not solved unless steps are made to motivate the unit, carefully thought out and applied in such a way that their effect is felt by all men in the unit. Finally, Excellence of the unit is measured by the extent to which those of the lower third of the unit are developed to play their part of the unit team. You know, still not 100% on board with that one. As far as I'm concerned, motivation is about understanding why you're doing what you're doing and giving people ownership. You want to motivate people? Tell them why they're doing what they're doing and let them take ownership of it and run with it. I feel like motivation um, is like kind of, all. there's like short term and long term. And you Mm -hmm. know how like... um, I was thinking of something very specific at the time where, you know, people get mad when they get angry at something. It motivates them like super hardcore, but only short term. Mm-hmm. And then if some, but if someone's the opposite, if someone's really happy or I don't know, thankful or whatever, that like keeps them sort of motivated long term. That's good. I, I, I would agree with that. Unless they have like some sort of weird underlying fear of something that might, you know, sustain them long term. I don't know. Yeah, you could get into some details, but I think a broad statement that like some kind of an anger would be a short, more of a short term motivation and a uh, a happiness, a satisfaction, a gratification would be more of a long term. I would would agree with that. Seems like that. I would tend to agree with that. All right. Now we're going to get into um, 
man, I thought those were kind of like, hey, we'll just burn through some of those chapters. I'm sorry. Because I wanted to get to this chapter, which is called chapter 13, Mission Type Orders, The Problem of Control. In World War II, those who served in armored divisions and probably in other units as well learned that mission type orders were a requirement if the most was to be obtained from a command. Since then, we have had, and mission type, so what mission types orders are, just in a nutshell, is you tell somebody what needs to happen and you let them go figure out how to do it. It's very, it's, de- it's, the, it's the basis of decentralized command. Since then, we've had to cons- consider the control of operations in the fluidity and unpredictability of nuclear battle. As battle becomes more complex and unpredictable, responsibilities must be more and more decentralized. Thus, mission type orders often will be used at all echelons of command and probably will be the rule at the division and higher levels. This will require all commanders to exercise initiative, resourcefulness, and imagination, operating with relative freedom of action. And this is what's weird. You know, he he oscillates between these sort of like, everyone should be, you know, how do we control the men? And he literally says in that earlier chapter, the, the, the middle group is easier to control. And now he's saying, hey, you need to let them go and operate. And it's really scary. I thought he was going to start talking about nuclear war. What do you, when you think about nuclear war, I think centralized control. I want 17 people to make sure that that is the right move before that freaking (laughs) fire button gets hit and those two keys get simultaneously turned. But he's like, no, decentralized command. That's pretty scary to me. in our, tactical, in our tactical forces, we have built-in organizational flexibility. We must recognize this and capitalize it in our orders. To get maximum combat power, we must have plans flexible enough to meet rapidly changing situations. But careful planning is not enough. This must be coupled with the readiness to change and adapt to situations as they are, not as they are expected to be. Awesome. What's interesting about that is he says we need to make... Uh, plans flexible enough to meet rapidly changing situations. And he says, but careful planning is not enough. When I think of careful planning, I think, oh, this guy's going to sit there and plan every detail. I don't think of somebody that's thinking, hey, we're going to come up with a very flexible plan. A flexible plan to me is not careful planning. I, I guess I might be reading too much into that. But I always felt like I cheated all the time because I came up with flexible plans for things. Yeah, yeah it seems like a carefully plan. Or a, a plan planned carefully is like you care you carefully plan for like contingencies. Or yeah, whatever. I, I guess carefully plan doesn't necessarily mean to be doesn't need to be like overly detailed. In fact, yeah. carefully plan could be like, hey, we want to be careful that we don't put too much detail in here. Yeah. <clears throat> and then yes, being able to adapt to situations as they are, not as they were expected to be, that's a critical way to operate. To train commanders and staff officers for operations in war where mission type orders will be widely used, it is necessary that tactical courses in our schools teach the use of such orders and that we widely employ mission type orders in our peacetime operations. I love that. So when you're gonna give people assignments to clean up the building, you don't say you mop and you scrub and you clean and you go. No, you say, hey, I want the building clean. This is what time it needs to be done by. And you let them go execute it. Mm-hmm. Boom. Decentralized command mission type order. And, and think about that. that. I just kind of blew that off. But that's a real thing. Like if you don't train people and you don't live like this, then you won't get good at it. You have to actually live like this. This has to be your way of life. If the way that you run your day-to-day operations is micromanagement, how can you expect anybody to do anything other than be micromanaged when you get into a bad situation, to get into a combat situation? You said something really solid on EF Online mm-hmm. that I was exposed to when you were like, hey, when you're in a meeting or you're having a meeting or something mm-hmm. and everyone's th- there with their pen and paper mm-hmm. waiting for you to say something, to write stuff down, and then when you start talking, then they start writing stuff yeah. down or whatever. It's a bad sign. Yeah, it's a bad sign, but it even but it feels good. It feels good. Because no one can do anything unless yeah. big job rolls in. Yeah, the yeah. man with the big ego and the plan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're really a horrible leader if they're all sitting there waiting. Yeah. We got two or three questions. We already know what we're doing. We know where we're going. Yeah. We're good. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, this is beautiful. <clears throat> Scope of a mission type order. Basically, a mission type order needs to cover only three important things. One, it should clearly state what the, commandy, what the commander issuing the order wants to have accomplished. That's number one. This is, what, this is what you need to accomplish. Number two, it should point out the limiting or control factors that must be observed for coordinating factors. So, okay, you can't go across this area. You can't fly over this region. You, you can't enter into this zone. Here's the limitations. And then finally, it should delineate the resources made available to the subordinate commander and the support which he can expect or count on from sources outside of his command. That's all you need to know. Tell me what to do, tell me what the limitations are, and tell me what resources I have. Other than that, leave me alone, I'm gonna go make it happen. That's the, that's, that might be the clearest definition of a mission type order I've ever read in my life. That's all you need. I got asked one time, I was in my first deployment to uh, Iraq, and my boss is like, what information do you need and how much time do you need to launch on a mission? And I was like, I need to know what, where the, the location of the target, the frequencies of the friendly forces, and I need 15 minutes and we'll go. <laughs> yes. Um, confidence in subordinate commanders. There is a strong reluctance at every headquarters to relinquish the authority to direct the details of an operation. This reluctance is clearly seen in the embellishments added to an order as it threads its way down to company level. Careful judgment must be made at every echelon of command in stating the limiting and controlling factors of a mission type order. Confidence must be placed in judgment and ability of the subordinate commander. Too often, what starts off as a broad mission type order at the high echelon ends up with volumes of minute, detailed, and restricting instructions specifying how to get the job done when it finally gets down to company level. Many officers hearing this may think they would like to have a command functioning under such a system, meaning I would love it if people would just do exactly what I told them to do, but you don't want that. Others who may say they would like to work under such a system really are disturbed by thoughts of it. There are some officers who require something in writing before they will take significant action. A mission type order requires the subordinate commander and his staff to make basic decisions and plans based upon a careful analysis of the situation. If the basic decisions or plans are not successful, there is no paper foxhole into which they can crawl. Mission type orders require initiative, promptness, and resourcefulness, which are not always forthcoming. Problems in service schools based upon such orders bring forth a variety of solutions which are difficult for the faculty to grade. Sometimes looms as a very important problem. What do you got? <laughs> Dude, that, there is so much there. You even gave this example of just cleaning the building. Just that little example of cleaning the building. The worst thing I can do as a leader is to tell you how to do that. Because the minute I tell you how, you know what you're gonna do? Exactly what I told you. And I'm gonna say this, 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 and this. What are the chances I get it all as a leader? Yeah, not, zero, yeah, right? Zero, zero. So what you're actually gonna do is what I told you to do. But I'm gonna miss a couple things. And actually the outcome is not gonna be what I want. And then, and then I as a leader, I'm gonna go out and inspect him. Like, hey, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. And what happens is I trust you less. So I'm gonna micromanage you even more, which means you have even less initiative the next time. And the connection from how to initiative, and I, what I wrote down was how by me telling you how to do what I want you to do, and I'm not saying like teaching you how to do something, I'm telling you how I want it done. That's the how you're talking about. Of course I wanna teach you how to do a task or a job, I need to train you. He's talking about, I want, this is how I want you to do this task, which is totally different. That is the exact opposite of initiative. Because if I tell you how to do it, you're gonna do exactly how I told you to do it. And then the things that I've missed, the things that I as a commander don't know because I'm farther away from the problem than you are, I'm gonna trust you less because the outcome isn't gonna be the way I want. I'm gonna micromanage more. I'm gonna undermine your initiative even more. And then when you're out there doing it on your own and I actually can't get to you, which is the connection from the training to the real world, which is why you have to live this all the time, that's when teams and organizations fail because I'm not gonna be there to solve all these problems for you, but I've bred this in you the entire time because I'm always telling you how I want you to do it. And you're like, cool, I'll do exactly how you told me to do it. 
and I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. You don't even know about this over here. I'm just not even touching that because you didn't tell me about that at all. But if you go the exact opposite, which was, hey, however you want to get this done, that's all good. What we need to get it done is by 1600 on Wednesday because what happens at 1700 on Wednesday is this, this, and this, and it impacts all that. Go make it happen. All of that is your initiative to go make that happen. Mm -hmm. Just the, con the connection between me telling you how I want it done versus your initiative and the, and the, in the inverse relationship between those two and how often we see that done wrong. Bro, that's so true. Like you ever, you ever drive with a micromanager, like direction giver, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, driving with you, you're just like, whatever, take this here, whatever kind of thing. <laughs> and that's a good move. Even if I make wrong turns, whatever, you know, you'll help or whatever, occasionally, you know, and you'll help whatever. But you get in, you, you ever drive with somebody who's like, hey, don't be in this lane. This lane is like too slow or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, make this turn. It's got, you know, like a micromanager, what do you call them? Front seat drive, back seat driver, whatever. That kind of person. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's say it's your significant other. I'm not saying it's my significant mm -hmm. other. I'm not, not, For a friend. I'm Let's not, just not hypothetically. Saying, <laughs> hypothetically, yes. Someone who you drive with a lot is uh -huh. what I'm saying. So, and every time it's like, hey, you know, you, we're going to go this route. Hey, get out of this lane. Go in this lane. Okay, take this turn. You know, okay, is it's coming out, you know, like really kind of micromanaging your driving uh, situation. Mm -hmm. After a while, you, you kind of get used to that. Yeah, so, and now and now all of a sudden you're not paying attention. They go, wait a second, you were supposed to take that turn. You're like, oh, why didn't you tell me? Yeah, about it? it's it's a weird subconscious almost. Why didn't you tell me, Sarah Charles? <laughs> <laughs> it's a subconscious almost dependence now. For sure, totally. that's yeah. exactly that's a hundred percent what it is. Yeah, that's a hundred percent. That's the initiative comment that I'm the connection to is like I got I'm going to take no initiative because I'm I'm you've been trained I've been, yeah to exactly. just wait to be told what to do. Exactly right. It, so just like how you're saying where now. If let's say I'm dependent on you to give me directions, you don't, you know, the leader, whatever, he doesn't always get it right or whatever. I make the wrong call or you don't give me direction. We'll say you don't give me direction. I take no action. And then, of course, it's done wrong. Now you trust me less. And now and around and around we go, That's, you yeah. know, so it's like, yeah, and man. I micromanage you more and I stifle even more of your initiative. Even more. Yeah, exactly. Right. You, you know, what's crazy about this? And Dave, you and I were talking about this before we pressed record. Is like I basically think in commander's intent. Like I, I think the way my mind works, I think in end states, and I and everything else to me is just sort of this, almost like an annoyance of reality. <laughs> and I'm so far, like when I want to do something, I'm so there that everything else is just sort of gonna fall into place, and I'm not even thinking about it. You know, whether it's like w when I'm starting to write a book, like I know what the I know what that book is. I know the end state. I know what it looks like. And now I just have to get those words out of my system when we're gonna launch something. It's like I already know what's gonna happen. Even if you think about something as stupid as this podcast of me being like, Echo, can you make a podcast? And you're like, well, let me go figure it out. You figure it out. I'm like, I don't even, ca I care nothing. I care zero. You show up with, you could have shown up with a, with a freaking, a tape recorder, and I would've been like, okay, is that what we're <laughs> doing? What Sounds doing. good, all right, yeah. we're, we're good. Because I know what, we're, I know where this is gonna go. I know where we're going. And so where, however we're gonna get there, it's like an annoyance to me, and it's an, it's an annoyance of reality. Yeah. Because of where my mind is, what I'm thinking about, where we're going. And that's, that's a positive thing for a couple reasons. Number one, if you're working for me, if you're making stuff happen, you're, you're good to go. I mean, you, you can just, you make stuff happen, but we're good. We're, we're good. We're totally good. I'm never going to bother you. Never going to bother you. So that's rad. And then also, the, the, I'm not getting caught up in these details, which means that step that I take is going to be a big one. It's going to be a big step. It's not going to be a little. I'm not going to take half measures. Yeah, we're going the distance. So I'm thinking and acting and kind of living in like an, a commander's intent kind of way. Yeah, it's not kind of. <laughs> yeah. For those of us that are inside that sphere, the byproduct of you as a leader thinking in outcomes and end states, if that's how you're thinking and, and leading your people, the natural reaction of the people around you is to fill in all those things to make sure that happens. And if you can take it a step further, if you can take it a step further as a leader and also be comfortable with the other side of it, which is a phrase that you use all the time, which I love, which is, you gotta expect those things to happen. Then it's no factor if exactly how you have this picture in your mind, you got a little detour, a little roadblock, little problem here. Hey, yeah, 
Those things are going to happen. And and we and we can solve those things too using the exact same approach which is if you have that attitude as a leader when your people run into problems, they're not going to be panic-stricken about what is the boss going to think because he's going to say, "Hey, look, I, I expect those things to happen. Those things are going to happen and I'm going to end up solving that as well." And so if you can connect the idea of thinking in end states around your people and also letting your people know you're not going to fly off the handle and jump right in there and start to micromanage them when get these little hiccups, these little deviations, because you actually in your mind, Jocko, haven't thought about all the things that happen between here and here. You don't really care what's going on in here. Mm-hmm. Cool, you go off the, yeah, cool. I expect those things to happen. Mm-hmm. But the minute you lay that all out, like all these 30 steps to get there and one doesn't go right and then you're involved in that, what that does to stifle your people makes it so much harder for them to get to your end state. So just combine the two of thinking in those end states and then letting your people solve those things along the way and not overreacting to the problems that occur as you're getting there because yeah, things are messy. Those, those little things are messy, but. Hey, by the way, if you're thinking about all those things in between, you don't even, you, you're not even gonna think you're about, gonna think about a, 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 a bigger picture. Totally. You're gonna be thinking like, hey, we need to move to this next ridge line. You're not thinking about where you're gonna end up in two days on this operation or where you're gonna end up strategically in three months. You're like, you're not even thinking about that. You're thinking about, wait a second, there's an obstacle right in front of us, what are we gonna do? Totally. And meanwhile, I'm like, I don't care. Yeah. I literally don't care. There's 19 different ways to solve that problem. Pick one of them and roll with it. And oh, you, oh, you, oh, it didn't work and you got to try again? Cool, whatever. I'm still over here and guess where I'm looking off in the distance? So we're good. That's a good point. And, I, and maybe, I don't know, maybe in my experience, which is nothing, but in my experience is um, like underappreciated or whatever, like not flying off the handle when things go wrong. Like if, if you, <laughs> like you know, you're like, hey, <laughs> but it's true though. Like you, yeah, you, yeah, you know, yeah. you, people have this misconception of you. Like, yeah. oh, what if Jocko gets mad at you for making this or doing that? This, the reality is, you don't really get mad at mistakes. You know, no. like you might tease me a little bit of whatever, yeah, but yeah. yeah, like you don't get mad. That, but what that does is, and when I was listening to you, Dave, say that and stuff, it it made me remember. Yeah, that's true. Like, I don't have a fear of making the wrong move if we both know where we're sort of going, you know? Yeah, and guess what? That means you can move. Exactly. That right, means you can yeah. you can make two, three, four, seven moves. Yeah. You can make seven moves and you never had to talk to me. And six yeah. of them were right, nine of them were right. 11 out of 12 were right. There was one wrong one, it set you back a half a move. And then you pressed forward and it was no factor. Right. If, if I was concerned that Jocko was gonna get mad at me for, so, uh, I don't know, what if I make the wrong decision on this? Like, should we do this or should I do this or should I not do this or whatever? But I'd be like, you wouldn't be making decisions. Time. Yeah, me. like, bro, yeah. it would work way worse. Yeah, somebody quoted you on Twitter. It was like, uh, a great way to not waste your people's time is to not make the de- every, not make sure that you're the one that's making all the yeah. decisions for them. Not make them reliant on you to make those decisions. Yeah. That's a great way to not waste their time. Yes. <laughs> and the beauty of that is that they're going to get you to where you want to go faster. For sure. I think you're right about that. For sure. All right. So this is how they close out the section. And this is, once again, this is such a, there's a dichotomy with General Clark. And this is part of that j- dichotomy right now. And he's talked about it before. The channel of suggestion. I have said many times that a commander has two channels within which to operate. He has the channel of command barking orders, and the channel of suggestion. I believe that a good commander who has subordinates who are trained and have the confidence to use mission type orders can operate almost exclusively using the channel of suggestion, reserving the channel of command for for use only when he wants to give special emphasis to an order to relieve someone or to take disciplinary action. That's the only time he's talking. Other than that, it's like, well, how do you want to do it? What do you think we should do? The only time he's going to bark orders is when he's going to fire someone, which is what relieve means, by the way. In, in the military, relieve someone means you're firing them or to, or to give disciplinary actions. Every other time, almost exclusively, it's channel of suggestion. You just made the leap by saying it. It was in my head as when when I'm hearing suggestion, I'm not even hearing suggestion. I'm hearing questions. Hey, what do you think? How do you think? Which isn't even what is that in saying in word because suggestion means like, hey, maybe we should do this. You're taking it a step further, which is how do you think we should do this? And then the flip side of too is that the hammer of, you know, as a commander, you have that hammer. You can drop that hammer. 
I can fire somebody. I can relieve somebody. I could reduce their rank. I could take their pay. There was a lot of authority in command. How often do you want to pull out that hammer? Mm. Man, the more, you know. Well, you just pulled out the big the big hammer, right? What about the little hammer? Even the little hammer is even worse. Yeah. The little hammer of like, actually, Dave, we need to do it this way. Smack. Yeah, that little. You know, actually, Dave, I don't like your idea. Smack. And meanwhile, you're getting all dinged up, and now you don't want to make any moves anymore. The suge- suggestion is, is, is actually question. How should we do this? Yeah. Channel of suggestion. Uh, here's the final little section. And this is, I, I briefed you earlier, Dave. I said there's going to be something I'm going to read that you're going to say yes. <laughs> so this is that section. Further the mission of the higher headquarters. I went to Leavenworth, and people think of Leavenworth, they think of going to prison because there is a military prison there, but there's also the War College. I went to Leavenworth over 20 years ago, so it is difficult for me to remember all the things which I must have learned then at the Command and General Staff College. The one thing that I have never forgotten and which has stood me in good stead was the teaching of General McNair, then Commandant, when he stated, quote, when you receive an order or a directive from your next higher commander, do everything you can and in the best way you can to further the mission which he wants to accomplish. End quote. An officer who follows his advice and uses it to interpret his instructions will find that he can act wisely, promptly, and aggressively with confidence. He will have no problem in operating in, in an environment with mission type orders. So, when your boss tells you to do something, freaking do it and do it to the best of your ability. Uh, uh, leadership strategy and tactics. I always have to go to this page, but uh, it's, it's, it's the, the, the things that says how to succeed as a new leader. Page 157, and then on page 158, it says, lastly, get the job done. Get the job done. That's what you're supposed to do. And that's what he's talking about. When you get told to do something, do it. People talk to me about how do I build a good relationship with my boss? Do the job and do it well. Kick ass. Give your boss credit. You'll start building a good relationship with him. <clears throat> Chapter 14. Organization for performing tasks on the company and small unit level. The purpose of this chapter is to set forth the concept of which I have found from experience improves training, uses time devoted to training more efficiently, and increases responsibility, prestige, and morale of the non commissioned officer, leader, and platoon leader. Organizational, use organizational units or teams even for work details. And I'm not gonna read this section, but what he says, we're using this example today of cleaning the building. What he's saying is when you clean the building, do it as a platoon. Yeah. So use mission type orders and then do it as a platoon. And, and that just helps them get used to how operating together, what people are like, what it's like for that leader, when that leader, what, what, how that leader relates to the, to the troops, how the troops relate back to the leader. You train how you operate. You work how you train. And then there's the, the last section in this part is let the leader lead his men, which this is the same thing. Under the detailed procedure of performing necessary unit tasks, all training teams are represented at all scheduled training. This may make a good showing in their training accomplished records, but it does not necessarily mean that they have actually received as teams the training that is shown on record. However, maintaining unit integrity while performing daily tasks will also enhance real benefits which we derive from our team training. So every day you should live, you should operate the way you are going to live and operate. Chapter 15, wasting soldiers' time. The value of time. We Americans have always been conscious of the value of time. Benjamin Franklin expressed this by saying that time is money. In our country, the efficiency expert who comes in to examine ways of doing things to eliminate wasted motion is highly paid for his services. He commands that high price because he is a saver of time. In the army, we speak of resources in terms of the three M's, men, money, and materials. To these three, we must add time. However, there is a distinct difference between time and the other three resources. If we do not use our money or materials today, 
they are available tomorrow. To a lesser degree, this is also true of men. It is not at all true of time. For the time for time is a highly perishable commodity. An hour lost today is lost forever. Echo Charles. It's true. I feel like he's training a lot of soldiers today on certain things. <laughs> <laughs> It costs several thousand dollars a year to maintain each soldier in the army. I consider that is probably a cost of $5 per hour per man for the soldier's training time that is available to the company commander. Thus, when the commander wastes an hour of his company's time, he may be wasting as much as $1,000. We would not want to be embarrassed if some agency became interested in investigating this in the field. That's an interesting way to think about it. Think about, you know, companies, 150 men. But think about your company, think about your business, think about your team. You got people sitting and you weren't prepared for the meeting or the meeting starts late or whatever, whatever it is. You think about what you're throwing away, you're wasting people's time. <clears throat> we are engaged in a contest with the communists in which there is no silver medal, in which no silver medal will be awarded for second place. I'm certain that it is unnecessary for me to dwell on the importance of the role of the U.S. Army in this contest. Our mission is to be combat ready. To my way of thinking, combat readiness has no upper limit. A unit is never 100% combat ready because there is always room for improvement in the development of military skills, reaction time, marksmanship, and the like. Combat readiness is a goal toward which we are constantly moving, but which we should never feel we have wholly achieved. Our progress will depend on our use of the resources which I mentioned previously. I want to stress the importance of using time wisely. And then he goes through a bunch of, you know, how we waste time. Time is wasted in administration and paperwork and red tape. And he says this, you should consider it unforgivable You should consider it unforgivable to remove a man from a scheduled formal period of instruction or practical work to take care of administrative matters. You cannot requisition a replacement for a lost hour of training. He also says here, we waste time when we overcommit our units. Or perhaps I should say, we do not make the best use of our time. That's something we gotta pay attention to on an individual level. You overschedule yourself and you actually end up wasting time. The same wastage is presented on the individual level when the strength of a unit is filtered away to participate in contests of non-military skills, to paint rocks, or plant flower beds in a likeness of the unit's insignia. (laughs) That's a shot right there. You go around military paces in America, there's some painted rocks out there, people. There's some white painted rocks that are lining some roads. And I'm gonna tell you, some privates painted those rocks. They probably got in trouble. It's, it's a little bit of a punitive measure. Oh, like punishment. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> it is training activities themselves which have the greatest potential for wasting a soldier's time. This comes about mainly because of ina- inadequate planning, lack of foresight, and lack of preparedness. Soldiers expect to be well trained. They feel short changed if they're not. If you're in charge of training people, which if you're in a leadership you are position, you are in charge of training people, and you're wasting your time, you are completely wrong. Here's another section I gotta re- read. Were the instructions clear? There is no end of time wasted when one who is to perform a mission or job is not fully and clearly instructed. The instructions are misunderstood. The end result is not what was desired. It must be done over. In fact, if things go wrong, the leader, in fact, when things go wrong, the leader should check first to see if his instructions were not the cause. It is said that General Grant assigned his adjutant the mentally slowest officer he could find. Grant read his orders to his adjutant, and if the adjutant could not understand, Grant rewarded his orders until he could. Ask yourself, are your instructions and orders so clear that every man, underlined every, he doesn't underline much in here, every man in your unit can understand them. When you issue orders, you are instructing someone. Remember that as an instructor, you only teach when someone learns. 
That's the, I always tell that story about the lowest common denominator, right? It's matter of fact, it's, it's in, I think it's in dichotomy. Well, hey, Leif and Seth, I'm telling them, hey, I want you to brief to the lowest con- common denominator in, in the platoon. Who, whoever you think is gonna have the hardest time, brief to your machine gunners. Your new guy machine gunners. I want them to fully understand the plan. I mean, that is the entire second law of combat brief, almost <laughs> verbatim, that he just described about the plan that's understandable, the way you communicate it, and then to the lowest common denominator, and then to me, in my mind, that actually comes back to the comment he made earlier, which was the effort you got to expend for having your lowest you know, people in the, you know, the, the, the bottom of your folks to, uh, for them to understand it, that, that comment he made before about devoting time to that, that's the time he's talking about. So he takes his adjutant, who he considers to be of the lowest intellectual level, you know, his bottom third guy. And I'll spend as much time as I need until that guy gets it. Yeah. And if he gets it, we should then be good. we are good to go. And so <laughs> even pulling that together, that comment made, I mean, that is, that is simple right there. So good. Do you fully, this is the last section here, do you fully utilize your soldier's time? I am not optimistic as to believe that we can eliminate wasting of time as we have yellow fever, but we can improve our performance in this regard. We can control this problem by the exercise of sound leadership techniques, among which are planning, good job management, issuance of clear instructions, and thorough follow-up. The most valuable resource available to a commander in the army is the soldier's time. As leaders, we must use this resource to the best advantage. I know of no better reputation for an officer or non-commissioned officer to have with his men than that he is a good manager and does not waste his soldiers' time. If he has that reputation, he will probably not waste his men's lives in battle either. That That's powerful. Uh, I've been doing a lot of talking about leadership capital on EF Online. In fact, I've been going kind of berserk talking about leadership capital on EF Online. And I've been talking about how to build leadership capital, how to lose leadership capital. And this is one that I haven't mentioned yet. And it's probably one, it's probably a little bit of a blind spot to me because I am a freak when it comes to time and wasting time. And so it's one of those things where I wouldn't, uh, it's so important to me that I've never, I've never you know, walked into a meeting two hours late to have a bunch of people waiting around for me to show up. Like that, that, that hasn't, that's not happening. But if you want to expend leadership capital unnecessarily and lots of it, make people wait around for you. Make them waste time. The phrase being late is unacceptable. (laughs) The reason it's unacceptable is because it wastes people's time. You could be the best pilot in the squadron. And if you waste people's time, you're going to lose leadership capital. Mm -hmm. You could be an average pilot, and if your reputation is that you don't waste people's time, they don't care if you're an average pilot. You actually, your leadership capital is is directly correlated to how you treat them and how you respect them and how you respect their time. Time wasted was always the, it was always the most frustrating and the most obvious thing that would happen. And I think I've said this on the podcast before. Everybody who's had their time wasted by someone else knows exactly what that feels like. Mm-hmm. You can think about it right now. Sitting around in the auditorium, sitting around, whatever it is, that time of yours that's being wasted because of somebody else. I don't care how good that somebody else is at their job, their task, or anything else. If they are a time waster, you are losing leadership capital. Let me ask you this about being late. Oh man, here we go. <laughs> Talk to I re- me. I need your opinion. On. What if it's, let's say, a Halloween party, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Hey, Halloween party! You know, there's gonna be I don't know, hundred people. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of people. Is this a party. fashionably late scenario you're getting to, or what have you? You know, so there's hundred people invited mm-hmm. or whatever, hundred plus because bring who you want. If mm-hmm. you know, it's not like a guest list. You're not invited. It's not that. It's just we're having a party, whatever. Okay, and. <laughs> Starts at, Speaking I don't know. Of wasting time, how long is this going to take? <laughs> Speaking, <laughs> or it, it starts at 5, okay. we'll say. All you right. know, 5 p.m. Okay. And goes all night, I don't know, mm. whatever. And you're like, all right, and you get there at 6.30. Mm-hmm. Other people are there, but you get there at 6.30. Is that wasting people's time? Is that bad as far as being it, late goes? If I send you an invitation to my Halloween party, and I say the party starts at 5 and goes till midnight, yeah. I don't care when you show up. If I say, Echo, 
be there by seven and you show up at seven thirty? Is there a difference between those two? I think so, yes. Yeah. But yeah, so my question is more about that first scenario, whatever. Like if it's like, hey, it's a, the party starts at five. Yeah, I was gonna say the party starts with or without you. Yes, so I'm yes, not yes. super concerned about you. Yeah. Nobody's not, nobody's sitting around but, waiting for you to get but there. Exactly the, right. The, contrarily, the podcast starts <laughs> when you're here. Yeah. So when you're not here, the podcast doesn't start. Yeah. You're the ones with the SD memory cards that go in the little machines over there. Sure. So yeah. when you're not here at uh-huh. three o'clock, the po- the party's not starting. I We're understand. waiting. I understand. <laughs> you're you're talking like it's for real. I was here at two fifty eight. What up? You made it in. Yeah. Well, that was legit today. As Thank much you. hassle I give you about Hawaiian time and yeah. being late, you're not late very often. No, sir. Do you? You play with fire. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, yeah, every day, I think. And technically, a lot of times, there's a minute, maybe. Maybe if you set, you were one of those people, if you set your watch like five minutes fast, you'd probably be on time all the time. Yeah, you if I if I believe it or if I didn't know, I yeah. set the watch. Yeah, I've done that before, too. Well, you know how I used to tell you, like, oh, I come from a long line of late people. <laughs> yeah. Remember when we were saying that? <laughs> Bro, my dad was, <laughs> he's Somebody like cracked up because I said, like, you got your DNA. You said you got your 23 and me. I said it came back late. <laughs> <laughs> you got no, jeans. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, but, but, and, you know, you kind of look into it. I'm like, why am I late or whatever? So, because I would <laughs> I would go to work late when I used to work yeah. at the club. I would be there late. Yep. I was there late, one minute, two minutes, five minutes sometimes, probably more time than I was on time. Probably. <laughs> for real. I'm not finding this hard to believe. <laughs> it doesn't seem like a stretch. And the thing is, technically, you are right. Like, I'm wasting people's time, especially if I, if people depend on me to get there. At that time, mm-hmm. you know, um, I'm not getting paid. You know, it's the kind you got to clock in. So you're not getting paid mm-hmm. um, if you're not there. So it's not that. It's like if people were depending on you to be there. But is there like a briefing to start the night? No, negative. It's so all independent. Yeah. Like you clock in and you're there. I mean, so it would piss me off. You know, yeah, I, I view boss. you as an unreliable person. Yeah. That I put no, I put no value in as a human. Damn. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I dig it. But. So I analyze like, why am I like that? Because mm-hmm. even if I'm like, I need to be late less, you know, it just wouldn't change. Why am I late? You, and you should change the statement. I need to be late less <laughs> to I'm not going to be late. Yeah. You need but to draw a little bit of a harder line in the sand. I understand. And you're my right. My little bro The thing is, you're, you're right. But when I, when I really be truthful, it's because I don't care mm-hmm. about what's going on there. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, why am I going to prepare like take 30 minutes to prepare this and prepare that for something that I don't have to be there at that. I have to be there at a certain time. So of course I'm running the risk. If, in fact, if I were to have my way, I would never be late at all, but I would never be early at all either mm-hmm. for things I don't care about, you know, mm-hmm. like, like that. I had one time in my life uh, when I was going to college at, and it was really hard to get parking. And Eventually, I figured out a system, but I had a SEAL buddy that he was going to college too, and we would study together, and we are bo- we were both on time all the time for everything, and eventually, we made a, a deal where we gave ourselves like a waiver to be five minutes or eight minutes late because if you were going to be there at two o'clock, in order to be there at two o'clock, you had to show up at one right. and drive around, and so we were just like, you know what? Hey, if you're five minutes late, 10 minutes late, doesn't matter. Like, I don't care. I don't want you being here an hour early so that you're not one minute late. Yeah. So we made a little pact and just said, hey, bro, I'll be there between 1 and one fifteen. Boom, all good. And I'd try and get there in 1, and maybe I'd get there at 108, and maybe he'd get there at one twelve or whatever. Yeah. Eventually, I figured out I would just put my bike in the back of the car and just park at the top of the hill and just bike no factor. Yeah. See, now you're thinking. Figure out how to solve these problems. So on the flip side, and this is all in the spirit of getting down to the whole late thing, because I agree with you at the end of the day. And if you think, if you really be honest, like I'm not late really, you know, anymore. Mm -hmm. Back in my day, for real, I was late. Yep. What you, oh, are you trying to think of when I was late? No, I, you were late a little bit in the beginning, but then, but then, like it didn't. It, I probably remember you being late three times total. Yeah, and this is like, not in, not including a four minute grace period, which yeah. sometimes I think you do just to just to you know. What do you mean grace period? You know, like sometimes if you're supposed to be here at one, you're here at one o four. Uh, Four yeah. minutes late. It's possible. You know? Yeah, the late times I'll tell you, hey, I'm late because of this specific yeah. reason or yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. but that's already. But nonetheless, like that is, I agree with you, where 
you're wasting other people's time. People are waiting for you. Like that's mm-hmm. it's it's kind of inexcusable in a way. But if you show up 15 minutes early, mm-hmm. aren't you wasting your own time a little bit? No, because what are you gonna do when you get there? You're gonna prep. Yeah, well, that depends. I, I mean, guess it depends on who you are. I Sun guess. Tzu told us 2,500 years ago that the one that shows up to the battlefield first wins. Yeah, you know, as far as battlefields go, <clears throat> for sure. Um, but certain circumstances, if you're there, let's say, okay, hey, I'm gonna meet you for brunch. You know what's in my bag right now? Oh, I could probably uh, the next book I'm reading on the podcast. When I show up here early, if there's no one here, cool, I get to read. I get to get ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's a good point. Okay, yes. Question answered. Because, yeah, if you show up fit, and you got to be thinking, I guess, at the end of the day. So if you show up 15 minutes early, you're not wasting your time because you can still choose what to do. You're not forced yes. to wait around for You're anyone. not waiting. Yeah. You should be proactively making something happen. Yeah, and you have that option. I mean, you technically, do. I guess if you're waiting for someone, you have that option, but like the, they're putting you in that position rather than you making the decision, putting yourself in that position, potentially. I understand. Check. I understand. Back to the book, chapter 16. So I was super fired up when I read this chapter title. Mm-hmm. And then to be honest with you, I got a little less fired up when I got into it. But because the chapter is, will you wait for it or will you go get it? I was like, oh, damn, (laughs) this is the chapter I've been waiting for. But what he's talking about is information. I'm still fired up for gathering information. And are you going to wait for information to come to you or are you going to go get it? I'm still I'm still fired up about it, but I'm not as fired up as I was. It's just like we're just going to make things happen. Mm -hmm. But uh, he goes in here. There's more than one school of thought concerning how a commander can acquire reliable information. One school contends that the commander should analyze reports that come to him from his subordinate units and staff. The other advocates that the commander should go see for himself. Yet another endorses a combination of these methods. As a commander from company to army group and as an observer of others holding such positions in three wars, that's gotta feel a little bit cool to write. I have come to certain conclusions myself. Moreover, since my Retirement from the Army, I have worked as a consultant to research organizations making studies of command control and communication problems for the Army. The result of this active and retired experience might be helpful to students and practitioners who should who would like to excel in the art and techniques of commandership and generalship. And then he goes here, looking back, it seems to me more than ever that my best information on both our own forces and the enemies was obtained by visiting or observing subordinate commanders. So there you go, I guess he's saying go get it. This is done either by Jeep or fixed wing airplane, borrowed from the artillery, small radios. He goes on, he says this, as a corps commander in Korea with five divisions on the line, I often left my headquarters by chopper by chopper after morning staff briefing and I visited the five division headquarters in turn from left to right. The divisions knew when I was coming. The division commanders were told that they need not wait for me and that I would talk to the chiefs of staff over a cup of coffee. We discussed the latest situations. Then we discussed the problems which had been presented by them on a previous day. Then I noted what they wanted my core headquarters to do to help them. So that's all good. He's gathering information. And then he says, I told them the situation of the 8th Army and of the I Corps as I knew it. So not only is he out there receiving information, he is telling them what is going on. So, and he ends up saying that he, that he did that. And it's funny, I was, I was, I was reading this and he says, uh, generally the next day I repeated this as a result. I was not only the Corps Commander, but the Corps Commander Liaison Officer and to a large extent the Corps communicator with the lower units. And I put in parentheses when I was reading this, it was a static war because at this point in Korea, you know, it was it was almost trench warfare, like they weren't moving. And then what's interesting, fast forward a little bit, he says, this was an ecstatic situation, but such command techniques are not unusable in mobile warfare. So get out there, get that information. Um, 
he's got this section in here. History is full of instances where the commander being at the critical point at the critical time turned the tide of battle to victory, or conversely, the commander not being on scene, his force was defeated. Few such examples have been related so dramatically as in the poem Sheridan's Ride by Thomas Buchanan Reed. So we're talking Civil War, we're talking General Philip Sheridan, Union General who was five foot five. We were talking about height a little bit earlier. Well, he was known as Little Phil. Also known as Fighting Phil and the Battle of Cedar Creek, October 19th, 1864 is when this went down. One will recall that early in the morning, Sheraton was at Winchester, Virginia, 20 miles away from his command when news of a new battle arrived. He mounted his horse and took off at full speed for the field of combat. Reed's stirring verse traces Sheridan's progress through five stanzas, stanzas, giving equal credit to both him and his horse. The sixth stanza shows what happens when the commander arrives at the critical point of battle and at a critical time. Quote, the first the general saw were the groups of stragglers and then the retreating troops. What was done? What to do? A glance told him both. Then striking his spurs with a terrible oath, he dashed down the line mid a storm of huzzas, which I had to look up. That's an old form of hooray. So the, the people started, ah. And the wave of retreat checked its course there because the sight of the master compelled it to pause. So there you go. The commander shows up on the battlefield and he turns this retreat into an advance and they ended up kind of smashing the Confederates in that battle. It's, it is inconceivable that the same result could have been attained on an automated battlefield, nor could Sheridan have been brought, could have, nor could Sheridan have brought order out of chaos while seated before a display panel 20 miles away. You need to get there, need to get there. And then he talks about why commanders should be forward. He talks about the the like computer stuff and, and again he's writing this. This originally came out I think in nineteen sixty three and then this version was nineteen seventy three. So he's talking about computers. <laughs> so God only knows what that consisted of in nineteen seventy three a like a mobile command computer. Oh, we need to get a we, I need to do some research on that one. And he says, these are fine until disorderly and confusing conditions uh, uh, that occur so often in battle materialize. They do not realize the roles of judgment. So he's talking about all these computations and these things that they set up. And, and he's saying, once those are, those are cool and everything's cool. But then once the mayhem happens, they do not realize the roles of the judgment and experience factors which must be used in handling tactical battle reports. Inevitably, these lead to a working principle such as and so here, here's, here's what the commanders are using to judge their information when they're using computer-based data. Discount by 50% all very favorable or unfavorable operational reports which come into your headquarters from your subordinate units and then question the remainder. So, so it's basically like this, just junk. Yeah. It's just junk. <laughs> and then he talks about the helicopter and using that to stay forward, which is effective as well. He's got this whole t- this whole chapter, ADP in war, will it work? It's automatic data processing. <laughs> so we're not gonna cover much of this. And he sets up this sort of hypothetical situation where he, he starts asking a bunch of questions about how well this AD, how well it's gonna work to use ADP during war. And a lot of this, it, you know, he's talk, he's literally talking about like, are there going to be power sources available? So it's really kind of nitty gritty stuff. But then he says, I would I would not be honest with you if I did not point out that commanders at all echelons are apprehensive of the tendency to use ADP to facilitate centralization of command and control. I can foresee disastrous effects from indiscriminate de- from indiscriminate centralization or over centralization and loss of flexibility in modern fluid war. Why is that? Because now all of a sudden the leader can track everything that everyone's doing. Hey, like Dave's in his aircraft and he's like, wait a second, go a little bit further to the right, go a little bit further to the left. We know exactly where you are. Wait, don't drop the bomb yet. Okay, drop it now. 
and we're trying to micromanage. Will ADP cause the commander to be more command post bound and thus reduce his ability to be at critical points at critical times? Let's see, that ended up being a yes. With its increased speed and capacity for information, will ADP in the hands of staff officers or of higher headquarters tend to encourage them to put increased burden of reporting on lower echelons who are often busily engaged in the vital conduct of battle? How crazy is that, Dave? Uh, it's nuts picturing what I saw, you know, from the talk in the in the command center, you know, picturing this being 19, what was it, 76, whatever yeah. you said. Yes, the answer to that question is yes, it will. Yeah, so that's what happened in the military. All of a sudden, we have the ability to get information, so we're going to require gonna demand it. the information. Yeah. We're going to want more of it. And you're going to demand it at a time that is totally incompatible with when they should be giving you the information. They want to know yeah. what's going on. Yeah, right like, now. Well, the reason you don't know what's going on is I'm in the middle of doing something right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got a little situation I'm trying to handle. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's how he uh, explains the whole ADP thing. Um, <clears throat> chapter 18, making progress and improving a military organization. It is the aim of anyone who is privileged to command a company, battalion, brigade, or division to leave, in it as, to leave it in much better shape than he found it and to be sure his superiors recognize that fact. And he goes through this little pluses method, which he's gone through before in one of the earlier podcasts, which you're going to make little, little incremental changes to get better. He goes over this section about protecting your image as a commander. A word about headlines. Most commanders who have sought headlines to establish their image, and I'm using those, uh, those are, he's putting those in quotes, mm -hmm. in the minds of their men and their superiors have sooner or later have been plagued by unfavorable headlines. Produce a superior, well-rounded, and solid unit, and your image as a commander will be secure, as will your military future. And then this is the this is the last thing that we are going to cover. I think. Oh no, it's not not yet. Not quite a year that. Yeah, it is. All right. So, chapter nineteen. Techniques of troop orientation and informed education. One of the most important duties of a commander is to keep his troops informed and oriented. This is done in many different ways with varying degrees of effectiveness. A technique I found very effective was to inform and orient by posters and personal visits. So he's talking about posters, literally posters that you hang on the wall. And this is why when you were talking about simplicity earlier, Dave, this is, this is kind of knocking out of the park. And when I said earlier on this podcast, when I was giving him a grade of a D minus for his simplicity of language in his mm -hmm. opening, he makes up for it here with these posters. In 1956, I took command of the 7th US Army in Europe at a time when the relationship of the troops with their German neighbors was at a low ebb due to a number of things. I think this is also when Hackworth was working for him. After studying the situation, I concluded that the transition from an army of occupation to the status of a guest army in a host nation had not been accomplished. So there's the wrong culture. There's the wrong culture from, from occupation status to like host, to, to a guest to a host nation. This is in Germany. So we went in there, we're occupying force. These were our enemies. And now all of a sudden we're saying, all right, that's not the deal anymore. Now they're the host nation and we're the guest. So he's, can you imagine trying to shift that culture? That's a tough culture shift. I set out to bring about this transition, not only for the soldiers, but for the dependents and US civilian employees in Germany. And so he comes up with this poster that, that the poster is called Soldier. And the, sol the, the poster just has this picture of a soldier who looks badass. And it says, Soldier, this is why you're in Germany. And it's got bullet points to play your part on the NATO team, to help maintain peace by being constantly combat ready, to be a good neighbor to our German neighbors, to fight if necessary for the rights of free men in the world. Simplicity score? Dave, what are you giving him? That's a significant improvement over the, uh, <laughs> He's the original the most D improved plus. award. Yeah, yeah, big time. Most improved award. So, so very obvious. Yeah. So that's what he did. He made this poster, and and then he did these visits. He did these visits where he would take the troops and and send them to 
check out what was happening at the Berlin Wall. So that's another way to make people understand why. And not only would he send the troops, but he would, if he could, send the dependents there as well. So they understood why. You go see the Berlin Wall. And then he made, and this is the last thing we're going to cover. Again, he's making this so simple and so clear. So along with that campaign to get people to see the wall, to understand what the purpose of being there was, to understand why we were there. He made this poster. There's a couple pictures of the wall. And it says, why? And it says, have you ever wondered? Why must the communists build walls and fences to keep people from fleeing the land where they were born? Why must they charge their fences with electricity, which can kill people who try to escape? Why armed guards along these walls and fences shoot and kill their own people who try to escape from their homes? Why, despite these walls and fences and guns, have over 4 million people left their homes, property, and friends and risked their lives to escape in the past 15 years? Why the communists surround themselves with walls and fences when history shows that this has often been the first step in the self-destruction of an empire? And then he says, why, why were these effective? These posters and Operation look which was actually traveling to the Berlin Wall, were effective because they used the most efficient techniques of, a f- of informing and orienting the soldier and of having his commander tell him in basic and simple terms about situations which are close to him and affect or could affect him personally. He gets it across as simply as possible. <sighs> so there you go. That is the that that wraps up our review of guidelines for the leader and commander. I have initiated the publication through Jocko Publishing of this book. We are reaching out to try and figure out what what needs to happen there, uh, but it's underway. Bozak has it for action. So we'll get it out, we'll get it published. Um, I'm sure that we will continue to refer to it. There's so many good lessons here. Even that last lesson, that the that these posters were effective because they used the most simple terms to explain to the soldiers why they were doing what they were doing. Something that I've been talking about for 20 years. Explaining people why they're doing what they're doing. And that is such an off, that's such an, such a, it's a response we use all the time at Echelon Front. All the time. My people aren't doing this. My people, can't, my people don't want to get on board with that. Tell them why they're doing what they're doing. Explain it to them in terms that they can understand. That's what he did. That's what he's telling us to do. Telling us to be more effective. Telling us to be more efficient. Telling us to not waste time telling us to be in good physical condition and to strive always. Remember what he said, you're never 100% combat effective. You never get there. You always have to strive to be better. So thank you, General Clark, for that. Echo Charles? Yes, sir. Uh, Speaking of getting better. Mm Mm-hmm. Or at least always trying to get better, striving to get better. Striving to, yes. Do we have any recommendations on you know, making that happen? Yes, we do, Dave. We do. I just saw Dave look at his watch. Yep. He I was looking at his watch thinking, all right, <laughs> I know I have work to do. <laughs> you, know what's, you know what's funny? You know what? Uh, I know okay. Dave has work to do. Uh, mm-hmm. I know I have work uh, to do. Yeah. I know there's one person. I'm not saying they don't have work to do, but they might have less work to do. They might have a less of a stringent timeline to follow. Well, you did say might, because, you know, you never do know. Okay. All right. All right, okay. I can okay, go down so the list of all the work I have to do. I'll tell you, part of the work I have to do is inform my people, our people. All right, let's do it. On how to get through or should I say move forward on this path we're all on? Boom. 
We're working out. We're taking jujitsu if we can. We're reading. We're we're surrounding ourselves with good people. It's a sliding scale. I understand. Nonetheless, these are things we're trying to do. On this path, we need supplementation. Don't worry. Jocko has fuel. It's called Jocko Fuel. Supplementation mm -hmm. for your whole body, all the way up to your brain. The last cell in your brain. Anyway, what, what we got? Joint warfare. We got joint I, warfare. I told you my wife has an injury. Not Just anymore. Feed, feeding her joint warfare. She's on her feet. Mm -hmm. All That's good. what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, every day. So joint warfare, super krill oil. These are all for your joints, for your bones. Keep yourself in the game. Don't even have to worry about them anymore. You take this stuff. Also, we have discipline, which is for your brain, ish. Mm -hmm. It's not just for your brain, mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. True, it's for your body too. So discipline, discipline, go, and then discipline, go in the cans. Mm -hmm. It's all the same family. We'll say, is that an accurate way to put it? Accurate. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. A uh, little note on discipline, go in the cans. So, look. <laughs> Are we at war? Yes. I would say yes. I mean, it, from a business sense, we're at war. We've had, we've been attacked. We had an act, let's just say this at a minimum, we've had an active war against us, a, another very large energy drink company has spotted an insurgency happening. They didn't like it. They're trying to maneuver to shut down some of our manufacturing. But guess who had contingency planning? <laughs> yes, yeah. us, but we're yeah. at war. So right now, hey, we are in Wawa in Florida. We want to be all over the East Coast in Wawa, and then we want to hit the rest of the stores across the country. If you're in Florida, go to Wawa. Get some go. Try some go. What flavors do you recommend, Dave? Yeah, Dave. All of them. <laughs> Let me ask you this: Are you how, how, how many? Are you have you drank one flavor enough where you shifted to another flavor? Like I've done that with milk, where I'll go on milk, I'll go on mint milk for three weeks, then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, that's strawberry. But right now I'm on that pumpkins. I'm on that smashing pumpkin, oh, pumpkin that, spice. Yep. That stuff is crazy good. So have you? Have you gone, do you, go, do you rotate daily? Are you doing random out of the box? What are you doing? I, I try to go random out of the box or out of the fridge. Mm -hmm. I try to go random out of the fridge. I have not done that the last seven days. Cause you're just straight. Dude, I am straight afterburn orange. That's what I'm right now. So my, my older two daughters kind of speak their own language. <laughs> and sure. one of the words that they've been using a lot lately is if something is very good, then it's a fantasy. And they say it in various funny ways. But then they've shortened it to say fant. Oh, that's a fant. <laughs> and so the other day, my middle daughter took a drink of Afterburner Orange. And she said, oh, that's a fant. Like a fanta. <laughs> yeah, so okay. there you go. There's a little, yeah, like an orange fanta, right? Little yeah, play little on words. Orange there. fanta. Right. I'm gonna have to agree with that one. The orange the after burner orange. That's yeah, good. that's the kind of the number one right now. It's good. Factually, I'm still just just Jocko Palmer all day. Yeah, and I understand. Oh, totally. I I've I will have probably for every four Jocko Palmer, I will have one orange or one sour apple sniper. Maybe a Dak Savage, even though Dak Savage, people like my wife's Dak Savage all day. Yeah. yeah, I could see that. Sometimes I just want to get a little like Dakota Meyer mindset. Sure. Just go get some of that. The Dak can. Just yeah. the Dak can is legit. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Yes, sir. But yes. So, yes. Discipline, energy drink, essentially. Oh, shit, I said it. Yeah. I said what yeah, I said. Yeah, yeah. Energy drink ish, health and it's a health energy yeah. drink. It's real energy, is what it is. It's real energy. Yeah. So, nonetheless, yes, these are the supplementation elements that we can call upon on this path. Also, Jock, you mentioned milk. So, you got all these different flavors of milk, protein in the form of a dessert. Mm -hmm. You just made it the Smashing <laughs> Pumpkin. I'm with it. I'm with the Smashing Pumpkin. Oh, it's yeah. good. What about kid approved too, by the oh, way? Oh, yeah. Kids, kids are all over that. 
it, it was declared a uh, full fantasy in my house. Full fantasy. <laughs> Is that the... My daughter's uh, declared uh, Smashing call? Pumpkin a full fantasy. Full fantasy. Okay. I'm, I'm going to kind of remember that, see if it sticks. Well, actually, I don't know if I want to do that. Nonetheless, it does sound cool when you say that your daughters say it, mm. but you can't start bringing no, that No, I, I can tell much. you that I won't start calling things like... <laughs> Right, oh, cool. that move in UFC was a full fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. It's not really going to flow. No, probably not. So, speaking of I'll full stick fantasy. With like, oh, that was cool. Yeah, mm-hmm. stick with cool. Old speaking school. of cool and full fantasy, mm-hmm. Jocko White T is also out there. Another light, refreshing element that we haven't spent that much time talking about, but that's mm-hmm. fine. It's still out there and it's still going strong, of course. Um, you can get that in a can as well. Right. You can get all this stuff at originmain.com. You can get it at the Vitamin Shop mm-hmm. nationwide. You can get it at Wawa, Florida. This is what, what is it right now? It's uh, November. November. Hopefully we'll get that whole East Coast take them. Now look, when I posted that we were in Wawa the other day, everyone's all fired up and like, okay, what about 7-Eleven? What about AM, PM? What, look, well, that's, what, that's the goal. Mm-hmm. Like I said, Florida's a little bit of a battleground state. <laughs> yeah, sure. So we hope, yeah. you know, when, when you, you're hoping People in Florida will get after it. Yeah, fully. Wait, is Jocko White tea in Wawa? Or just nope. the discipline, right? Just discipline the discipline. Goal? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. Boom. Also at originmain.com, you can get this stuff. Also at originmain.com, you can get other stuff. Mm-hmm. Jiu-Jitsu stuff, mm-hmm. geese, rash guards, uh, some various, you know, whether it be workout clothes, clothing, shirts. But on top of that, American-made denim jeans also Did boots. you get new Deltas? No, not yet. Okay. Did but you get new Deltas? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so the new Deltas, they're freaking legit. And uh, yeah, they're just, the old Deltas I thought were the best thing that you could put on your legs, but now the the new Deltas, which if you're ordering Deltas now, they're the new Deltas. Mm. And they're freaking the best thing ever. And they're what, they're kind of um, sh- like stretchy-ish. I mean, obviously they, they, they're not they, stretchy. They do have, they do have stretch to them that way when you throw that full <laughs> fantasy roundhouse kick yeah, yes, the fantasy roundhouse you're kick. good yeah okay you're not ripping your pants yeah that's good for sure okay well there you have it full fantasy <laughs> stuff um yeah jeans boots all american made stuff this is a big deal and and i think we all know that and we all know why also we have our own store yeah i said it i said what i said all right, it's still Jocko's store. So that thing, what you just said, yeah. I said what I said. Yeah. You know that's kind of a thing too, right? From, I yeah, I don't know. Okay, what, what's well, that's from? another thing that my daughters are saying. Okay. My older daughters. I like right? that one. I think it's very funny. They'll be like, I said what I said. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, there is this joke, like, you know, the, you know, the memes online. It's yeah. a, it, there was this joke that it was like, I forget even the joke, but it was it was really funny and since since then I, I started I appreciate memes oh yeah me too. I appreciate memes and I even appreciate people that have you know like a hat that says veteran of the meme wars and they have they've yeah. awarded they've been awarded whatever yeah. awards you get for the meme. maybe they got a nam <laughs> with five <laughs> five names nam. spot yeah, names. Yeah, yeah. so yeah I, I the memes are good yes but, I agree but somehow I don't the memes don't flow to me it's always my son that shows me memes. Yeah, I don't know what the hell he subscribes to on the gram, as There's you call it. Yeah. But he shows me some memes that are funny. Yeah, they're and really funny. Yeah, whoever's making it, they're smart people. Like yeah. the, you know how you can, you know, some jokes are like, bro, that's like not even. A f- it's like a cheap joke that's not funny. Mm-hmm. And then some are like, you got to be whoever thought of that, made that joke up, is like a smart funny person right you know like right. there, there's some impressive stuff on there for real like i i inadvertently well or advertently whatever <laughs> subscribe to like a bunch of them it's, it's really good <laughs> it's really good and yeah full-grown man fully memes all day um but yes i said what i said it's our store <laughs> okay still called jocko store so anyway yes jocko store that's where you can represent with clothing t-shirts Hoodies, discipline equals freedom, good, all this stuff. Here's the thing. I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. It's a big deal. Mm. We have a t-shirt club. Mm. Okay, so this is what the t-shirt club kind of is. It's like, okay, look. The t-shirt club is Echo coming up with a lot of different t-shirts and me saying, dude, we can't make a million different t-shirts. 
because how are we going to keep a million different t-shirts in stock yeah and how many and all that stuff yeah and then you come up with a big creative idea <laughs> uh, yes that well uh, you know i guess you get credit. it, it hey, depends on you, what you, you you had the end state in mind yeah right you figured a way to solve that problem well i think it's good because also on top of that which um yes that's true but on top of it it's like sometimes we, uh, like even you'll be like hey put this on a t-shirt or i'll be like oh you know like suggesting mm. like a t-shirt and it's a good it's fun it's a fun good idea or cool or cool because let's face it you come up with ideas for t-shirts that are fun and i come up with ideas for t-shirts that are cool oh yeah super cool extra okay cool, are, you not, are you denying about that no no no, no. all good it's true it's 100 percent true actually but we can't just start, like you said, just throwing these shirts on, like, mm. or whatever. But the idea of, you know, so these ideas for shirts, they, they, they're, they're doable. Also, people. The people always oh, yeah. say, can you make this t-shirt? Can you make yep. that t-shirt? That'd be a cool t-shirt. Yeah, so. and there's some that I'm like, that are shirts that we talk about. Yeah. And then someone will be, hey, you should do this shirt. We'll be like, yeah, we just talked about yeah. that kind of thing, you know. So it's like all these ideas, hey, we'll throw it in one month. We'll have it, you know, you can have it. And it just goes on and on. It's good. A little subscription situation. Anyway, it's a good t-shirt club. Real fun. Okay, I so think. because you're kind of kind of just giving me a look when I said I come up with cool t-shirt ideas, oh, no I'm going to say one mm. that will be available through the t-shirt. What is it? Subscription? Sure. Chuck it. Yeah. So here's one. A podcast number 53. There's one part. This is the Chosen Revel Reservoir. We're talking about the book, Colder Than Hell. And there's one point where the Marines are fighting for their lives. And they're assaulting down a hill. And there's a guy, the guy that's writing the book is writing what he's seeing. And he sees these guys getting up and charging. And one of the Marines is not holding a gun. He's holding a freaking axe. And he's charging at the Chinese communists and assaults their position and so that's what i want to put it on a t-shirt a silhouette somehow of a crazy picture where you can tell that there is a marine with an axe running down assaulting a communist position and all it's going to say is on that is like colder than hell podcast 53 that's it you know i want that t-shirt yeah i agree that is actually Dave, impressively awesome. That's a cool shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Boom, good you should deal, make Dave. That. Approved, yeah. Agree. So anyway, yes. Yeah, so you know stuff like that. Anyway, check it out if you want. It's that's on JockoStore.com as well. Also, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. You don't. I mean, I don't know. Don't subscribe. Subscribe, right? That's a thing. It'd be so, cool if you subscribe. Okay, yeah, that boom. way you're listening to it. Yeah, so you're. We're making them. Yeah. We're probably making them faster than you can listen to them, which is interesting. Possible. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you are. Because you have, we have, Chocolate Podcast. Yep. The Unraveling Podcast. Well, yes. that's that's on a different thread now, yep. by the we, way. We Someone moved just contacted it off to a different thread. Yeah. They're like, hey, you you haven't unloaded Unraveling or whatever, even though you said you did. Here's the thing. It's a different thread. So you got to look for it or whatever. So it's called The Unraveling. It's actually called The Jocko Unraveling Podcast. Podcast. Yeah. So search for Jocko Unraveling and you'll find it. So it's Daryl Cooper and me talking about. May I've been listening to them. They're freaking legit. Yeah. It's, it's, it's awesome. So check that one out. We also have the Grounded Podcast, which we haven't recorded one in months. You know, because we've been on quarantine, so we haven't had. Oh, wait. <laughs> we haven't recorded ground, Grounded Podcast, so we'll, we'll knock one of those. And I know I owe Warrior Kid. And I got Warrior Kid 4 coming out, so we'll get some Warrior Kid ones done as well. We got a YouTube channel if you want to see Echo's videos that he's super proud of where he makes a bunch of stuff blow up and whatever. Sometimes. <laughs> or with airplanes. Whichever. Yeah, it's good. Also, the video version of this pod podcast, by the way. If you want to see what Good Deal Dave Burke looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Nonetheless, yes, YouTube channel. Good. You good, can subscribe good outlet. to that. Yeah, subscribe to that one Didn't as well. Didn't you say we're like official or whatever on there? Official, yeah, we're oh yeah, yeah, they're like verified, verified or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so yeah, that's how you can tell that that's the real one. So I it's, think. A, it's just Jocko Podcast. Yeah, Jocko Podcast YouTube channel, all good. Boom. Also, psychological warfare debrief podcast. 
Did we say it? Oh, yeah. No, we didn't. Okay, yes. Uh, Debrief podcast. Jocko and Dave Burke. Jocko's reading my notes. Yeah, well, I can see, you know. <laughs> I see you write something. I'm like, oh, wait a second. We got another podcast, but it comes out on this thread. We haven't broken it out yet onto another thread. I don't know if we will. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see what happens. But anyways, it's really, it's us talking about what we do at Echelon Front, working with clients. And it's just all, it's like 100% leadership. Right, it's a leadership injection in directly into your veins. There's no, there's no books to be read. They're shorter. They're like half an hour, forty five minutes. Yeah. Would you call it like a case analysis kind of situation? Some, some of them are case analysis. Some are just lessons learned. Oh yeah. Feel. You know what it's like? Uh, it's like some of those books that that I've covered. Actually, I've been covering them recently. Those direct reports from combat from World War II. They're like, this is an interview. We want to get this information to the troops as quickly as possible. That's what the debrief is. It's a freaking debrief. Mm-hmm. It's Dave and I debriefing what we do on a daily basis to help companies and help leaders lead their companies. So yes. that's what the debrief podcast is. Yep. Also, Psychological Warfare. It's an album with tracks. Jocko getting, helping you pass your moments of weakness straight up in whatever capacity that you might run into moments of weakness. <laughs> Uh, Flipside Canvas, Dakota Myers Company, making cool stuff to hang on your walls that will keep you on the path, written a bunch of books, and got a bunch of books. Uh, we got a book called About Face. I wrote the forward for that. It's by Hackworth. This whole series of whatever we just did, six podcasts about guidelines for the leader and commander, I found that through About Face, which is my favorite book, which I wrote the forward to, so you can check that out. Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual. We got the code the evaluation, the protocols. We got the new edition of the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. This is the Christmas New Year's gift book. This is what your people want. Wrong, am I right? You're correct. I'm correct. Uh, A bunch of new material in there. It's like something like 40 new pages in there. And if someone you know wants to get on the path, back on the path, needs to get on the path, if you wanna stay on the path, Get them that new version of the Discipline Equals Freedom Field Manual. Got Way of the Warrior Kid 4 Field Manual coming out. How are the kids liking it, Dave? <laughs> My kids are so stoked on that. <laughs> That's one little section that they really like. Oh, right on. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Uh, that's good. There's, let's just say there's layers in the book. Layers. We'll say that there's layers. We like so layers. Way of the Warrior Kid 4 Field Manual. Um, Young Mark meets a kid, like last day of school, the kid wants to be a warrior kid, but he's leaving, he hasn't said anything because he's shy. He comes up and says, oh Mark, I really wanted to hang out with you and your friends and be a warrior kid like you, but I'm leaving, I'm moving. And so Mark goes home, last day of school, now Uncle Jake's there and he says, oh, you know, I met this kid, he wanted to be a warrior kid, but I can't help him. And Uncle Jake, of course, says, yes you can. You gotta write him a field manual, what's that? It's instructions on how to be a warrior kid. So that's what the book is. Way the Warrior Kid 4, field manual. Don't forget about Warrior Kid, Way the Warrior Kid 1, 2, and 3. Don't forget about Mikey and the Dragons. And of course, don't forget about extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership. Don't forget that I have a consulting company. Leadership consultancy, we solve problems through leadership. Whatever problems you have in your organization, it's a leadership problem. And what we do is we solve those problems through leadership. Go to echelonfront.com for details. Go to EF online if you wanna ask me a question, if you wanna ask Dave a question, live. We will be sitting there answering your questions. If you wanna go deeper on the materials that we talk about, we have video courses on there. So check out efonline.com. We only have one muster in 2020. It's in Dallas, Texas, December 3rd and 4th. Go to extremeownership.com for details. This is our leadership conference where we get granular, where we interact, where we explain these principles so you can take them and make your business and your life better. We have efoverwatch.com. If you need executive leadership inside your company, you need middle management inside your company, you want people that understand the principles that we talk about here, go to efoverwatch.com. And if you wanna help service members, if you wanna help active duty people, you wanna help retired people, you wanna help their families, you wanna help Gold Star families around the world, then check out Mark Lee's Moms charity organization. Mama Lee, she has an organization called America's Mighty Warriors.org. You can check that out if you wanna donate or if you wanna get involved. And if you, let's say you want more pain, you just want more pain, we can deliver. You can get more 
of my distressing diatribes. You can get more of Echo's misplaced monologues. And obviously, you can get some more of Dave's concentrated confabulations. You can find us on the interwebs on Twitter, on Instagram, which Echo will only refer to as the Graham, and on that face. Ah, Dave is at David R. Burke, Echo is at Echo Charles, and I am at Jocko Willink. And thanks to General Bruce Clark and Colonel David Hackworth for passing these lessons on to us and for your service to this great nation and to everyone out there in uniform. Thank you for standing the watch and for keeping us safe and also to police and law enforcement and firefighters and paramedics and EMTs and dispatchers and correctional officers and border patrol and secret service. Thanks to all of you for standing the watch here at home. And everyone else out there, remember this one thing from General Bruce C. Clark. An hour lost today is an hour lost forever. Don't waste time. It is running out. And with that, Until next time, this is Dave and Echo and Jocko out.